My name is Philip Cantio. I'm a postdoc here at the University of Texas Medical Branch, uh, and I've been working close with, closely with Veronica Montes de Oca, uh, Cocos Marquetes, and Rogelio Sainz to put together the 2021 ICAA. Originally, we were supposed to have the ICAA here in Galveston in 2020, and uh, for obvious reasons, that didn't happen. And unfortunately, today is the most beautiful day in the history of Galveston. It's a crisp fall day, and we wish you could be here with us. But instead, we were happy to see your faces virtually. So I'm going to turn it over to Cocos to make a few remarks and introduce uh, the principal investigator of the ICAA. Well, first of all, I actually want to thank Phil because he's done tremendous work organizing this and, and working with our company, was an associate. Uh, yeah, we were supposed to welcome everybody in Galveston. We delivered on the weather, but uh, here we are. So welcome to Galveston remotely. Uh, so uh, the ICAA has been going on for a long time with Dr. Jacqueline and Hill's leadership. Uh, and it's been held in different places. And it was supposed to be here last year, like Philip said, and, 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 and we were hoping this year it would be uh, in person, then remotely, and then, of course, online. But uh, thank you so much. And uh, Jackie is going to say a few remarks. Uh, she's a distinguished professor at the University of Texas in Austin uh, in the LBJ School, but also sociology, uh, a long term uh, colleague of mine and, and others who will be Hispanic, Asian, and health and a tremendous leader nationally in Hispanic Asian, uh, who has held this uh, conference uh, funded and going for so many years. So uh, I want to thank you, Jackie, for being part of our academic life, so many of us. And uh, thank you uh, again for kicking off this uh, conference. We, we hope to have a really good two days. Uh, and I also want to acknowledge uh, Galveston, the UTMB, Austin, Rickmar for co-sponsoring uh, this event. So Jackie, you're on. Thank you, Cocos, and bravo to UTMB for putting together all of the pieces to bring us all together today. Bienvenidos and welcome to the 2021 International Conference on Aging in the Americas. This is our 12th installment. What I'd like to do in my introduction is to give you a brief history of where we've been, bring you up to date on what we'll be doing during the next two days, and then where we're headed. So next slide, thank you. I want to thank everyone for joining us today. And if you could just um, circle back for just a moment. I, this this uh, beautiful uh, pr uh, print was uh, commissioned uh, by the Conference Series on Aging in the Americas by Roberto Salas. And it's um, was created as, as, uh, since our inception um, to represent our change and transformation and health of quality of life within cultures, between cultures, and across cultures. And we've been focusing on the changes in the health and quality of life of our older Mexican American population, our Mexican in Mexico, and their families. I want to uh, turn to the next slide to give you a brief overview of where we've been since 2001. Uh, it was just the initial uh, presentation where we were viewing uh, intergenerational supports using the Mexican Health and Aging Study, as well as the Health and Retirement Study with uh, Beth Soldo and uh, Rebecca Wong. And that, that installment was uh, our first and, the, and in 2005, we received our first NIA support. We're focusing on just health and aging, just getting our, our feet wet. And since that time, we've had specific uh, iterations of the conference theories through a, a competitive renewal uh, application to the National Institute on Aging. And all of the uh, participants today and those of our colleagues that work together, as Coco said, mentioned, 
to um, really move and advance the field. And today we'll be focusing on resilience and aging in the Americas with a special focus on Mexico and the United States, a Latino population of Mexican origin. I also wanted to point out, this is a special series because we always have focused on at, uh, across both sides of the border. The, this uh, month we're celebrating National Hispanic Heritage um, Month. And this uh, month from September 15th to October 15th, we always like to have this uh, co-occur with uh, Mexico's Independence Day as well. And we tried to do that since 2005. Next slide. This is the team. We, we have been guided by a, the Conference Series on Aging in the Americas Advisory Group. We have our co-investigators, which is Dr. McKaides, Dr. Fernando Torres Gill, and Dr. Vega, as well as our emeritus uh, advisory group members, Mark Hayward and Alberto Palloni. Um, sadly, we, we lost Steve Wallace uh, this year, and he's played an ex extremely active role in our activities. Our publications have been an important part of our dissemination efforts. This is an important part of an R13 application. Our most recent volume is Understanding the Context of Cognitive Aging in Mexico and the US. We, uh, we have a publications committee and we alternate publications uh, versus um, peer reviewed publications. We're on our fifth series now. Um, we'll be moving on to the sixth series. Next slide, please. We also have a robust mentoring program for our early career uh, Latino and Mexican scholars, as well as others who wanna participate. Uh, they have been amazing and tremendously productive. Not only are they publishing in the leading peer reviewed high impact journals, but they're also um, submitting major grants and getting them funded. R01s, R03s, R24s, KO1s. They are getting uh, prestigious uh, postdoctoral fellowships, traineeships with NIA. And all of these placements, these career placements um, are just incredibly impressive. And we're very proud of them. And the CA advisory group and others have helped us make this possible. Next slide, please. So for uh, next two days, we're going to work very hard on uh, focusing on resilience and aging in the Americas. As I mentioned, we'll be focusing specifically on Mexicans and Mexican Americans, but also Latinos in general and Hispanic uh, origin populations. The issue is particularly um, salient uh, in light of COVID-19. At the time of writing this application several years ago, we, uh, th this global pandemic uh, hadn't uh, ex exposed its ugly head. And uh, now we're sort of uh, in a position now to really try to contribute to the literature of this important context, because we know uh, in addition to some of the conceptual and methodological issues that we're gonna be focusing on today, it's important to understand those aspects of resiliency that enhance health and well-being um, in different contexts, social context, community sport, economic, occupational participation, as well as political levels. And that's important for us to do. Next slide, please. Just brief rundown here. I know many of you uh, are going to be jumping in and um, and off uh, based on your schedules, but we're, we're um, really ready for an exciting uh, program. It's uh, going to begin uh, with our keynote uh, address uh, with uh, Rebecca Wong. Uh, we'll have a poster session, uh, our early career mentoring, consensus building. Uh, we'll we also have an external reviewer, Dr. Robert Wallace, and he's been with us for many years. I wanna thank him for uh, agreeing to be our uh, external consultant for this project and reviewer, review all of our outcomes and also provide directions for what we, can, we should consider in the future. Next slide, please. These are the three questions we'll be focusing on in our consensus building session. 
we will obviously, uh, we already have uh, many of those who are here today, but others who will be joining us. And we have five groups. We'll have breakout groups. It's, uh, we, I wanna encourage everyone to uh, participate in this because this work will be widely uh, uh, published uh, to, on our CAA website, as well as other publications. We're particularly interested again in conceptual issues, methodological issues, measurement, as well as maybe some modeling as well. And also uh, the, the unique context of, of caregivers and, and what this role of resilience means to them. Next slide. There's our sub team. And you can see here the full agenda uh, broken down into uh, exactly what we're going to hear today. We'll, we'll wrap it up with our early career mentoring, which is such a critical part of what we do. And again, we'll be ending with our consensus building session. I want to highlight here that we'll, uh, we have renamed our poster session for today's the Steve Wallace poster session because of his commitment uh, to uh, emerging scholars, uh, early investigators. We'll also be having a uh, Rick Marr uh, scientific panel <clears throat> Uh, led by uh, Lourdes Guerrero, and as well as a COVID-19 panel and discussion. This was uh, something, again, we have added to the program in light of the situation that we're in now, and also recognizing that this will, have, this will ha likely happen again, and we need to be prepared and better understand not only what the risk factors are, but again, how we can look at uh, assets in this community. There's been a heavy focus on uh, the detriments to those aspects of resiliency. We really want to flip the narrative around. Next slide, please. Where are we going? We have a proposal under review now uh, for a special issue of the Journal of Aging and Health. Um, we're a generous invitation by uh, Dr. Kiriakos Markaitis, who's been a tremendous uh, support system for us because the cost of special issues is very expensive. Um, we thank him. We also have heading um, ahead of, of us is our 2022 ICA meeting. It will be in Chicago, Illinois. It's going to be organized by Flavia Andrade, Fernanda Reyes Mena and uh, Martha de Viglis. And then we'll be heading to uh, Los Angeles in 2023. If you wanna mark your calendar that far ahead, uh, we will be at UCLA. And then finally, in coming right up, is our 2021 GSA Symposium of ICA investigators. We always try to, after this meeting, uh, submit a, a competitive uh, abstract on much of the work that we're engaged in. And uh, Dr. Roach and myself have co-organized co uh, the symposium called Care in Context. Where we'll be looking at dementia and support systems in both Mexico and the US. At this time, I wanted to thank all of our sponsors. Uh, we would not be here without you, our collaborators, and just to underscore this point again, there is no I in team. We have all worked together to make this happen. So thank you, thank you, and thank you. And with that, I'd like to introduce um, our special uh, opening remarks by Dr. Octavio Martinez. Dr. Martinez is executive director <clears throat> He, of the Hogg Foundation for Mental Health. He also wears other hats at the University of Texas at Austin, including uh, serving as the senior uh, associate vice president within the Office of Community uh, in Engagement and Integrated Health Initiatives. These are overlapping departments. Uh, most importantly, uh, he's serving on the current health equity task force on COVID-19. This is part of the CDC Centers for Disease Control and Prevention's effort for preparedness. Uh, he keeps us on track with regard to uh, protecting our 
our participants. Um, and we appreciate his guidance. He has received many, many honors and I'd like to welcome you, Octavio, and please share with us your thoughts and remarks. Thank you, thank you for that introduction. Let me pull up my slide here. And um, just wanna really thank ICAA, um, definitely Texas Rickmore, UTMB. Wish we were there in person. The weather is great, guys. I don't know what happened here. Well, we know what happened, the Delta surge. But anyway, and of course, UT Austin. So, but I do want to, uh, I am humbled and, and um, asked to make some remarks. And so uh, it's a real pleasure. I thought, uh, I'm so looking forward to this, especially after the wonderful meeting we had in Mexico City and all the publications and the research. Uh, it's just really fabulous what all of you are doing and just tremendous. Uh, I'm going to start with definition, right, of resilience. And the reason uh, I want to start with this is because usually when folks think of resilience, and I must say usually I'm talking about like the general pop population, not you as subject matter experts so much. But, you know, it's about rebounding or springing back, right? Uh, the ability to come back from adversity or in the physical sciences, elasticity and coming back to an original shape. But that's not what really resilience is when you think about the human condition, right? What it really is about is a process of negotiating, managing and adapting to the stress and traumas that we experience over the course of our lives. So it's not just about bouncing back. I think it's more than the basic biological model about recovery from an insult. And definitely, it's more than just the clinical focus, especially now as we go forward into the future and the kind of research that now is being done. And so it's really, to me, about positive adaptation at multiple levels, because we're not just bouncing back and going back to the original uh, you know, status that we were at, but in fact, it's actually about changing over time. That's what resilience really is from a human, from a human perspective. And it's at multiple levels. We're complex human beings, as each of us very much knows. And so uh, it's about the macro, it's about the meso, and it's definitely uh, about the micro level. And within that, I think that is, uh, I love that the fact that how resilience is so important to us and that this conference is about resilience and aging in the Americas because it's the capacity to bring together those thoughts, behaviors, and actions that we promote individually at the family level and at a community level for well being. How? By developing processes where we cope, adapt, and thrive, given everything that we have to endure during a lifetime. And this is, of course, across the entire spectrum, right? From the time we're born to the time we're called to meet our maker. And, but what we're concentrating on and what you concentrate on is really, I think, that wonderful uh, time of transition that we call, you know, aging or, or elder. And historically, there have been four main domains, the physical, the mental, functional, of course, and our social, that are extremely important. But I do feel that now we're getting a, a much more research what you're discovering, what you're bringing to the table about what are those resilience factors within those domains and even be expanding beyond those domains. We know about the individual, and this is not a, obviously a comprehensive list, but some that I just pulled out, I feel are very important. As a psychiatrist, of course, personality traits, self-esteem has been identified as being so important for each and every one of us. Then there's the whole new uh, field continuing to grow of epigenetics, recognizing we don't live in silos. We don't live external to anything. We live within environments. They change us and we change them. And one of the areas that I'm really excited about is not only epigenetics, but also the understanding now of what we're calling the social determinants, recognizing that there are system forces out there that impact us as human beings, regardless of what country you live in, regardless of what geographic area or place on this planet there are now these determinants that we are identifying. And there's a whole you know, litany and list there. Uh, I'll start with, uh, and just wanna mention the adverse early life experiences because it's just been amazing to understand and to start to see and, and the transformation and then the, the, taking it from research to, to actual clinical you know, implications and outcomes of understanding that what happens when we're very young does impact us throughout our entire lifespan, including into our older age. And so I think there's that bridging of understanding of the complexity of development over a lifespan that we have to take into consideration. And how can we intervene and change the trajectory? 
because we know the more adverse life experiences at four plus, as we know, really greatly increases risk factors for chronic diseases, for mental health uh, issues, as well as substance use issues. But we, but we are not, uh, you know, made of stone. We can intervene and make changes along the way, regardless of what, how old you are or in what phase of life you're in. It might be a little different. It might take a little longer. But that's what you, uh, I, I'm excited about what is being talked about. And, and I love the, the agenda uh, for the next two days where I think you, the subject matter experts, are going to bring us along in thinking about these very kind of issues. Because where we're going, where I want us to go, where all of us are working so hard, is to create a healthy aging environment for all of us. Where we have, at an individual level, we have the right kind of resources. Where we have quality and fa family experiences where our financial resources allow us to be able to, in fact, weather the storm, be it man-made or natural-made, right? Regardless if, we're, if you're living in Texas or in, uh, in, in Mexico or in La Frontera, it all makes, uh, it's all so important. The quality of our social networks. We are social beings. That's extremely important concept for us and one that is just so relevant for our ability to be resilient. And of course, what does the belt environment look like, including starting with our home? Is it designed, if we have to be in a wheelchair, that you have an easy ramp, that you have uh, uh, wide enough hallways to be able to turn and to go back and forth? Do you, do you have the necessary equipment to be able to take a shower? Those are, those are very important. Accessible, safe streets and neighborhoods. What's happening external to the home is equally important. No one should be denied the ability to go out and experience to say this wonderful weather and wanting to go to the park into green spaces, let alone is there sufficient lighting uh, around one's home and in one's neighborhood or sidewalks, or at least uh, it being safe enough where you feel comfortable to go and, and go visit the neighbor or, or a loved one across the street. And the quality of that built environment is extremely important as well. Talking about spaces in the public buildings, are we thinking about what it, happens during the transition of life and as we age. And of course, public transportation can be extremely important. To a certain extent, we are able to take care of our own transportation, but then there comes a time when one may, may no longer be able to drive oneself as an example. Well, what, else, what do we have? Can, are we still able to be as independent as we can, to be able to age at home or age in place so that we're able to do our own grocery shopping to go and, and visit uh, family members and loved ones? Those are the issues that really come to bear. And all of these are related to the previous slide on those social determinants. And especially if you think about stable highs and food security, and of course, access to healthcare and so forth and so on. And culturally and linguistically centered, it must be. If there's anything that I think this pandemic has been as showing is how important, we've all known that pre-pandemic, but I think this has been highlighted and is showing to the entire general population how important culture and language truly are when it comes to say rolling out a vaccine, when it comes to actually uh, giving the information so, for folks to make an informed decision to take the vaccine. They call it you know, vaccine hesitancy. I don't like that term. I personally prefer and have written an op-ed that it's more about uh, vaccine equity. There are systemic issues that are actually imposing upon us in making those kind of decisions. And so there must be a respect for cultural linguistic and social diversity of, of all of us, and especially also of our elders. The United States Mexico Frontera, it's a really unique microcosm. That's why I think it's so exciting about this conference in ICAA and how, as Jackie showed, all over the country, but also binationally, we meet together to be able to really contemplate and think about what are the issues we need to tease apart? What are the gaps where we're missing research? And also, how do we develop then policies to make a difference? Because between the two countries, there's the, the community approach versus the individualistic that is seen so much in this country, and then role of acculturation. Often, at least I was taught, mostly we concentrated on how one uh, of Mexican descent or from Mexico came to the US and acculturated and how things changed over their lifetime. But that's no longer the case, is it? It's binational. You have many United States citizens moving to Mexico. So they are culturating to Mexico's environment, to Mexico's culture. So now it's both ways, which I think is super exciting. And especially the frontera, which in and of itself, like I said, it's a unique microcosm and where the border is artificial. Families live on both sides. Culture lives on both sides. 
that you know uh, commerce lives on both sides and health lives on both sides. We even have folks that we call snowbirds, right? The ones that are coming down from Michigan and Wisconsin, they come down to the Rio Grande Valley and they're getting their health care in Mexico, not in the United States. Why is that happening? There's a lot of reasons, right? And yet that's why this is such an important topic. And of course, we can't do anything this day without COVID-19 or the pandemic, as Jackie mentioned. You know, if you want to have created uh, the ultimate stress test for humanity, this is it. And we are excelling in some arenas, but failing in many others. And I think one where we continue to, I think, fall short is how we're taking care of our elders. And, because, and that's where it originally began. And I've heard some comments that are just raised the hair on the back of my necks uh, in reference to like who, who deserves to get a vaccine, who deserves to get uh, the monoclonal antibody therapies is another example. And often, and I think you know where I'm going with this, Folks are saying, well, they're older, they've already lived their life. Baloney. That is just inappropriate. That is unethical. And I hope that all of us really fight for that. Pre-pandemically, though, we already knew that isolation and loneliness was a huge, already in and of itself, epidemic that's happening not only in the United States, but even in Mexico and around the world. What is happening to us, to us social beings, that interconnectedness where an individual, though they may have many be in the middle of a crowd are still feeling very lonely. That subjective feeling of being isolated. We really need to address this issue and this pandemic has exacerbated and even elevated, elevated it anymore. Because we know from research pre-pandemic, it'll be interesting to see during now 20, 2020 and 2021 going and forward, further, how these statistics will change. But pre-pandemic, we know that it impacts our physical and our mental health. And in fact, increases not only morbidity, but in fact, mortality. Loneliness, we know it's linked to depression, poor sleep. It accelerates cognitive decline, impacts our cardiovascular system, and also impairs our immunity. Think about that, especially during a time when actually we're fighting off a virus where our immune system is so important to us. And of course, systemics reviews have shown that suicide risk increases with loneliness, not only in attempts, but even in completed suicides when it comes to our older adults. And I think we're going to find that it might be across the entire life spectrum as well, as more data is being uh, collated and being uh, reviewed and, and, and researched. And so this is not a trivial matter, but one that could be very elevated and impacts and has no boundaries. Pandemic, we, the entire world being impacted by this. And it'll be really, I think, looking forward, interesting to see what kind of research, what kind of questions, what kind of answers will be coming from, you know, ICAA and you, the researchers, the subject matter experts in this arena. Because what it is, is we have public policies, we have social norms that in fact have resulted in unfair, unjust distribution opportunities that are filtered through the social determinants that ends up with adverse outcomes and inequities overall for us. And so health equities have been worsened during this pandemic as well. And so from a research practice and policy standpoint, it is so important for the work that this conference is doing and what each and every one of you are doing because from our research, we can translate and turn it into, into practice, but also influence where are the policies, what needs to be changed to ensure, in my opinion, that we invest and support age-friendly systems, that we develop living environments that support well-being as we age. And that is going to happen to everyone. By the grace of God, we will all turn old. We, that is our hope. <laughs> I don't know of anyone that wants to end their life early. Well, those that do in psychiatry and, and of course in behavioral sciences, it's because there are other variables, other you know, insults they're having to deal with that has led them down to that path. And so what we need in essence is to align public services, public and built spaces, legislation, income support, our taxation systems, housing policies, social values and attitudes, and do it through a culturally and linguistically centered health equity lens to ensure healthy aging for all in Mexico and here in the United States. And through that, I think, as we often say at the University of Texas at Austin, we can influence the entire world as well because we all need this. We're all in this together. And with that, I wanna thank you and send it back to you, Jackie. Thank you.
Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Martinez. I know that uh, Dr. Peek has to run really quickly. Are you still here, Dr. Peek? Oh. I am. Yeah, uh, Dr. Peek is going to give the official uh, introduction from the University of Texas Medical Branch, Dr. Peek. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I just want to welcome you. It's wonderful to be hosting this esteemed conference here at the University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston. I'm very sorry it has to be under virtual circumstances. As Dr. Martinez said, we have beautiful weather here, um, but for pandemic safety precautions, we had to proceed that way. But I do wanna send everybody a very warm virtual welcome to UTMB. As you know, UTMB is home of world-renowned scholars on aging and health disparities, and two of the most important longitudinal studies of older Latinas. We are home to the Hispanic established populations for the epidemiologic study of the elderly, the Hispanic EPIs led by Cocos Marquides for close to 30 years of data on Mexican Americans in the Southwestern United States. We're also home to the Mexican Health and Aging Study, the IMHOS, led by Dr. Rebecca Wong, has almost 20 years of data of older adults on Mexico. Both studies provide foundational data for presentations you will see in the next two days and are critical resources for scholars of Latino aging. UTMB is also home to the World Health Organization and Pan American Health Organization, the WHO and PAHO, Collaborating Center on Aging and Health. Our collaborating center focuses on research to improve the health of Hispanic older populations by establishing collaborations with institutions in Latin America and the Caribbean is also committed to training scholars with a cross-cultural multidisciplinary perspective. In addition, I also wanted to highlight the Texas Resource Center on Minority Aging Research, the Texas RICMAR, as a co-host for the conference and to recognize the role of the broader RICMAR network in supporting the type of research highlighted at the ICA today. Finally, we've recently received, I wanted everyone to know if you haven't heard already, uh, approval from the UT System Board of Regents and the Council on Education for Public Health for our brand new School of Public and Population Health here at UTMB. We're actually beginning the transition immediately to a school and are excited to continue the essential health inequities we research of many of the scholars represented in the conference here over the next two days. So we're just delighted that you're here virtually. Um, hope to be seeing people in person soon, but we're very happy to be hosting this important conference and thank you all for joining us and I hope you have a very productive and engaging conference over the next day and a half. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so we are just a little bit past time for the opening remarks. Dr. Fernando Rios Mena, would you introduce our next speaker, please? Of course, uh, I'll be brief given that, uh, can people hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Yes. Thank you. I'll be brief given, given time and, and given that uh, Dr. Peek actually talked about some of the units that uh, Dr. Wong is very involved in or has a heavy hand on or units and projects. So, uh, but it, it's my absolute pressure, pleasure, excuse me, to introduce uh, Professor Rebecca Wong, uh, Peaches and Shrub Kempner, Distinguished Professor in Health Disparities and Vice Chair for Research at the Department of Preventive Medicine and Population Health. Uh, director of the WHO PAHO Collaborating Center on Aging and Health, and Associate Director of the Claude Pepper Older American Independence Center and the Sealy Center on Aging. So some of the units, again, that, that uh, Dr. Peek discussed uh, already. Uh, so uh, Dr. Wong has uh, many uh, different kinds of lines of research that are very, uh, where, where he has, she has made a, a very important impact, including uh, the social determinants of, of uh, health and aging in, in Mexican origin populations on both sides of the border, uh, uh, the impact of especially of uh, public policies, uh, uh, in, including uh, pension reform, for example, as well as uh, more recently social uh, policies uh, uh, to combat uh, poverty abatement uh, 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 pro programs uh, aimed at uh, older adults in particular, as well as the general population. Um, and anyway, so a lot of this has been uh, powered by by Dr. Wong, Dr. Wong's um, main role in the Mexican Health and Aging Study, right, as as one of the PIs of this project, and uh, uh, which has generated a lot, a lot of research. M much of it done, or a lot of it done by her, but a lot of it also done by others, or, or in collaboration with others. Uh, as part of these collaborations, Dr. Wong. So again, Dr. Wong is a, a great facilitator of. Of research in that sense, uh, um, and uh, a mentor, a, a mentor as well to uh, many people, including myself. 
So we're very grateful for your role into uh, all of these uh, areas. And, and we're going to hear today a little bit about uh, resiliency in aging from Dr. Wu. Thank you very much. Hello, I, I think I have been unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay, thank you. Uh, can everybody see my screen? Yes. Yes, we can see your screen, but the, uh, like the, there you go. Now it's your notes. Uh, it, okay, it I need the, to swap. I need to yeah. swap, right? Yes, please. Okay. If I can swap. Well, somehow I need to swap out of my notes and I oh, can somebody do that for me? It doesn't let me do it. Somebody's taking over my screen. <laughs> I see that things are moving and I'm not doing any movement. Can Rebecca, you I, I'm, I'll run your slideshow. Okay, it's on, it's on. I think it's on, right? Yeah? Okay, it's running. Thank you. No, I'm not running it. Uh, am I'm I running, running it. it? I'm running it. Oh, okay. Um, Thank you. Um, thank you. I'm sorry. I, I'm seeing two screens. I need to make sure that I'm seeing the one you're showing and not okay. the one I'm showing. All um, right. It shows an outline. Yeah. Okay. Can you go back a little bit and just that I, I would just want to thank everyone. Thank you, Fernando, of course, for that wonderful introduction. It's always a pressure, a pleasure to hear from you, to see you all. And it's a pleasure to uh, be in, in uh, the ICA conference once again. And now, of course, um, we wish we were all in person in Galveston. And um, I'm going to say, just as an introduction, that over the years, we've seen many scholars go through this conference. And so it's a pleasure to see them, prepare them, uh, prepare them to present. And they come back after presenting. And they're always very excited about what they learned, how they networked, what they saw, who they met. And so it's, it's uh, thank you very much for the organization and the perseverance to continue with this effort um, to all the organizers and co-organizers of uh, ours today. Um, with that, I would like to say, next one, please, Phil. Um, I was asked to talk about resilient aging and I'm gonna start by saying that that is not one of my topics of research. And so, but I am, I, I was delighted. I embraced it and saying, okay, I'm going to learn. Of course, I've heard of the term. I've seen them in lectures and so on, but it wasn't one of my topics of research. And so I wanted to learn what has been done. What is uh, the, the uh, in particular, what's the potential of the databases that we are producing? We are mostly data producers, but also data users. But what is the, the potential of the databases that we're producing to, continue to feed and, and provide data for researchers to work on this topic. And so I, that's how I'm taking it. And so I learn about it, what is being done, what is uh, the potential in the future. And I'll, I'll talk to you briefly about that. The individual network community and society resources that are, uh, as Dr. Uh, Martinez mentioned, are needed to provide this uh, uh, healthy aging and how there are factors that protect mental and physical health from shocks. That's the, the general en environment in which we'll uh, look at uh, resilience, uh, resilient aging. And then I'm, I'll talk to you about a couple of examples of relevant work using the MHAS data. And that demonstrates the potential of the databases for the study of resilience. And then I'm gonna end by telling you what I think is next, what I think is next for us, again, as the data producers that can feed you the data as users, so as researchers, so that we can all advance research in this area. Next, please. 
So again, Dr. Martinez introduced us very nicely to the definition of resilience. Uh, so briefly here is the ability to bounce back. There are assets and resources within the individual, their life and the environment that facilitate this capacity, this ability to bounce back. And like he said, it's more than that, right? And I'll talk a little bit more about that. There are challenges across the life course that will vary among individuals. And hence the experience of resilience will vary because of those uh, of the life course. Thank you, next. Then I'm gonna just talk about how I understood it. In the early literature, there was uh, resilience was studied mostly from children's ability to overcome trauma. And later resilience in old age became prominent and, and the term resilient aging came to be. The, there was a focus then on recovering in both physical and psychological dimensions of function. Starting from today at the 2008 GSA meetings already, you know, uh, 13 years ago, the theme was resilience in an aging society, risks and opportunities. And it was very fashionable, of course, very important because of the economic recession of 2008 and how and who was going to uh, bounce back for uh, the lack of another term and how many years and who was going to do it, how, how, what form the um, coming back and recovery from the economic recession was going to take. And the question then was how do the life experiences that people had influence the resilience in old age? And of course, the theme was the end very important, but the, the focus was of course in developed countries and the US population. Next. Similarly, there are other positive psychological concepts that are, that are uh, used with um, resiliency, successful aging, we heard as one of them, recovery as another one. And so here, the importance of mastery, social support, self-esteem, the meaningful roles and purpose in life, there, these roles could be in the work environment or in civic engagement or in family uh, engagement. And so there, there's this, this roles that start to come to wandering uh, beyond health and going into the psychosocial, psychological um, feeling of uh, positive views of, uh, of the life. And so the person, the positive view focuses on maintaining and enhancing the function in late life instead of only recovering from setbacks. And so then is this capacity for learning, having positive emotions, striving with meaning in life, openness to new experience, expanded life space. These all add to resilience. And so I wanted to say all of these, it, it, go ahead, uh, Phil, thank you. I wanted to mention all of that because you start to see, and, and if you know the, the studies and you know me, I, I don't work on these aspects, right? I work on economics and sociology and disparities, but we're very much looking at health and, uh, and, and other many dimensions of health. But this, this starts to be more like resources that we need to capture that the individual can, uh, can uh, accumulate over the life course that have to do with psychological, biolog biological resources that are provided by their age, their gender, but their health behaviors that they adopted over the life course, and the material resources that like Dr. Martinez mentioned, your education, your employment provide those material resources that then provide these uh, uh, cumulative means for you to become resilient. The community factors such as what the family support and the social support that the community so around you provides, the social cohesion, the social participation, housing characteristics as, as they were described. And also then more macro, as we we're saying, uh, going from the individual to the immediate community to the macro society, we need to know about social policies, health and social services, neighborhoods, and economy. These are all factors, again, that are the resources that provide and shape this um, resilience. And so now, as I said, I, I arrived then and look at, so now we're talking beyond prevention and treatment of illness. We talk about adaptive responses, which are modifiable, measurable, and then the, the conclusion is that we need to work more on linking biological, psychological, and social aspects of aging in order to talk about this uh, ability to produce uh, uh, successful uh, aging. The goal, of course, in many of the literature uh, uh, is the current literature is to find actionable things that we can modify and we can act upon what are the next steps for interventions. 
by large healthcare organizations or larger community organizations that they can modify or um, help the community and the population come, uh, achieve this resilient aging. And so we are right then to think we have, we need different levels of resources that form this resilience. And so this is the thing that you cannot see me handle my mouse. And, and that's the only problem I have with Phil. Phil, you can handle my mouse now. Uh, it implies high demand of data, right? So we need uh, characteristics of the individual and then characteristics of the family and household, characteristics of the social context, characteristics of social policies at the macro level across the life course of an individual to try to understand how all of these characteristics will form and shape resilience. And so again, as a data producer, we think we need all of this to feed you, the researchers, all the data that we need in order to advance in this field. Next one. And then not only that, this is a, 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 a diagram that I took from uh, Kim et al. And it just highlights this, this, not only we, do we need all these resources that I, I was describing, but we need to be able to measure stress that is suffered by the individual in any given moment, right? The stress that happens and, and we have been measures of all those aspects that I was saying before the stress, then the, we measure the stress and then we measure the recovery or after the stress. So there's a psychological well-being, social well-being that kind of the, that forms this resilience uh, in, a, in shaping in many different factors. And then that, that forms some kind of resilience that you have before the stress, then the stress comes and then there's an illness or a, a, um, a natural, like we were saying, Dr. Martino was saying, a natural or man-made disaster or a, a, a widowhood or something happens to some one of your kids. And so there's a st stress that comes and there's a deteriorated process, but there are also these behaviors and functions that can be recovered with the restorative process to come back or return or produce some way of healthy aging. And so again, over the life course, there's a social and physical environment that is created or that is around us to manage this uh, stress and its consequences. Yeah. So uh, again, and so you, you get the idea that this is rich data that we need to provide. We need to study it with very rich data. So the, the study of resilience in low and middle income countries then has been in general severely limited by lack of data in comparison to what developed countries have had. Um, and so longitudinal and national data has been um, uh, in short supply. And, and you understand that we need longitudinal because I just said you need to know, to understand the uh, before the shock, the shock and after the shock. We need national data that can uh, cover the disparity, the diversity of the population in each of our societies. And we need all these content, health, social, economic, psychosocial measures at various levels that I said, individual, community, society. So now I can, the, the good news of course that I hope I can convey is that there are more recent efforts that have started to provide the data. And the Mexican Health and Aging the study, the MHAS, is comparable to the US Health and Retirement Study and other studies in the world can provide, and, and I hope to convey that in the next few minutes, um, that, that kind of data that could potentially start to uh, in, uh, provide this, this kind of evidence. Um, the US, the, the Mexican Health and Aging Study is harmonized with the US HRS, but it's also harmonized with other data in low middle income countries like China, India, and Brazil right now, and other countries as well. The multi, uh, very quickly, the, the study is the multi theme study for some of you, uh, the scholars who know the health and retirement study in the United States, they know these are the, the, the this is a very similar study, but done in Mexico. It covers sociodemographic characteristics. These are surveys that follow people over time, uh, covers health in multiple dimensions, uh, chronic diseases, infectious diseases, uh, cognitive assessment, um, ADL, uh, activities of daily living limitations, instrumental activities of daily living limitations, as well as symptoms, uh, visits to doctors, and so on. 
family and social networks, childhood experiences. In, in, so there's a lot of um, uh, life course historical perspective, migration experiences in the past, help given and received from your family to your family, psychosocial uh, aspects such as personality, loneliness, locus of control, life satisfaction, environmental exposures at work, at home, economic data, health insurance, pensions, income, assets, um, wealth, work history, current employment, characteristics of your current dwelling, the attitudes about health, economic status as well, the attitudes about the economic status. Widowhood, if you become widowed as we're following your time, we know what happens to you if you become widowed. And last year of life, we ask from that person that dies over the panel, we interview a relative to learn about the last year of life. We learn about time use and activities that people do um, frequently. And we also have a few biomarkers, performance measures, anthropometric measures. So this is a, a rich data set and then becomes uh, possible, as I was saying, to think about the possibility of doing resilient research. Quickly, the, this is the, the, the timeline of the study. The study started in 2001, so it's turning 20 this year. And it has had a, a, a several waves of, of data collection. The top, you see the, the baseline sample started among those born in 1951 or earlier. These are people 50 and over in 2001. And there are about 15,000 uh, are interviewed. And then they were followed in 2003, wave two. There was a hiatus in the study and we um, started again in 2012. At that point, we added from the top, the green part is those born in 1952-62, um, the, the cohort that had aged. And so we start following everybody at the moment they're recruited. So that was wave three. And wave three in 2012, we form a very important partnership with the Mexican um, National Institute of Statistics to continue the study every three years. And they and us are committed to try to uh, continue from then on every three years, adding new sample every six. And that's why we completed to 2015. And in 2018, we added new sample, the cohort born in 63, 68. And those are followed from then on. In 2018 was completed uh, wave five. And we're planning wave six in 2021 COVID permitting at the end of this year in November, December. But very important, this study has become a study of mortality as well, so that you learn about the determinants of, of course, you, you observe the subject, you follow them, then they die, and then you learn about their last year of life. To uh, 2018, we had a cumulative disease of 5,632 people. And unfortunately, we know that by 2021, we're going to have a lot more. Now, why, why is it important for us and why this study was revived in 2012? Because it allowed us to study shocks, structural shocks that the uh, e economy in Mexico, society in Mexico went, on, went through, through the life of the panel uh, around 2003. Then there were structural reforms that started in 2007, other reforms. And of course, in 2008, the US economic recession hit Mexico in 2009. So there are all these structural shocks that were that happened between 2000 wave two and three that now we are able to study them by looking at you know the the again two waves that we had before then and then the subsequent waves so we can look at recovery and um, what happened and how long does it take for someone to recover from those shocks in some cases the shocks are positive there was universal uh, a move towards universal healthcare in some cases. There, it's negative because of the recession. And there was also a migration of the US migration, US, uh, Mexico US migration. There was a contraction, as many of you know, um, by 2010, the net migration from Mexico to the US is zero. And so that is a major contraction, meaning the, the, the older adults go, that were in, in, in the US at the time went back to Mexico. Many more are found in Mexico, but also. Uh, many of the children that used to be in the U.S. went back to Mexico, uh, although it continues to be the case that almost 20% of all adults in our study have at least one child in the United States. 
now, of course, uh, I'm sorry, just quickly to say that in 2019, uh, early 2020, the rollback of social programs happened. And so um, the new program, uh, this has been an anti-poverty program in existence in Mexico for more than 20 years. Uh, uh, pros oportunidades, Progresa, Prospera, change names, but it continued to be an anti-poverty program and it was rolled back um, in late 2019, early 2020. So we're gonna see the consequences of that as well, potentially by studying people in subsequent waves. Now, what, uh, because I talked to you about the need for many data sources and types of data, we also provide data linked to the MHAS from aggregate data from multiple sources. So for example, we have uh, starting on the top, uh, the air pollution from monitoring stations in a time series is linked to the MHAS individual data on those waves that I mentioned. Then the census variables, this is a historical census uh, data that's uh, at the aggregate level, uh, cumulative and linked to the MHAS data, as well as the recent censuses 2010, uh, 20, I mean, 2010 and now 2020 will be linked to the MHAS individual data. We have a, a census of health services in the communities in Mexico provided by the Ministry of Health, and that's linked to the individual data as well. We can link, we have linked the mortality rates. Um, and these are the vital statistics when you can observe in your community the mortality rates by total and by causes and, and, and groups of causes in, uh, in link to the mortality to the MHAS records. And in the la lower left, there's Seguro Popular enrollment. This is part of the one of those rollout programs that was rolling as a part of the reforms that I was mentioning, and we know how the enrollment happened, how it was rolled out. It was rolled out differently by state and so on. So we know the historical series and we can link it to the MHAS. So this, this has provided then the context, the macro context that we were saying uh, of policies and programs that are happening in, in the community and at the, at, at the national level. So now I'm going to turn a little bit to talk about a couple of examples that I wanted to highlight of uh, resilience and then selected results with people, researchers that have done work using the MHAS data. Um, you, you start to get a sense that it, it's possible to do it and then went and looked at who's done it, who's, who has used the data. And so uh, work um, with um, researchers that looked at trajectories of mental and physical health in particular, depressive, depression in the form of depressive symptoms and physical disability, ADL disability, after stressors, after a serious fall and or after widowhood. And so they, they separate the outcomes into mental and physical health and the stressors into either a fall or a widowhood. And so you, you look at uh, these events that happened between 2001 and 2003, and then you look at how people were in 2012 nine, potentially nine years or 10 years after the event, the, the stress. And so they form latent classes of trajectories and they can follow trajectories of people who, who maintain uh, the low function, people who maintain high function, people who improve the function and people who uh, uh, decline in function. So in general, this is a very, a very interesting paper. I, I invite people to read it. If they are looking at resiliency in Mexican um, population, and these are, they found common factors that foster favorable trajectories and net worth, which is uh, wealth, right, assets, cognition, and the ability to uh, function cognitively, and subjective well-being were predictors of most trajectories. So these are potentially, uh, the authors argue, aspects that one can uh, look at as potentially helping uh, predict favorable uh, outcomes and conserve uh, resiliency. In the outcomes, as, we, as you remember, they were looking at mental health and physical health. And it turns out that mental health is more likely to have long-term negative effects. So they are less likely to bounce back from mental health than from physical health. Um, and so regardless of the stressor, if it was loss or, or of a spouse or a fall, they are more likely to um, uh, bounce back from physical health, ADL disability, than from mental health, depression. 
There are individuals who bounce back beyond the starting point that is improve beyond where they started. So, but this is more likely to happen in physical and uh, ADL disability than in mental health. And, and they also find unexpected results. One of them is that social support, which is one of the uh, well-recognized, well-established uh, factors to preserve uh, favorable trajectories actually do not have much effect on the predictive power for the trajectories. So these are very interesting. I, I see, I, I say this because they, they really do what I was saying before. They look at a shock, they look at before, they look at after, and, and they are able to make these kinds of conclusions. In conclusion to me is that the, the heterogeneity of results according to health outcomes and type of stressor tends to sweep the literature. Well, I saw it in, in several of the resources, but in this one too, um, they all conclude that we need more longitudinal studies. I, I, I actually can see that to replicate with other outcomes because there's so, so variety and, and so heterogeneous, the results are so varying that we want to look at other outcomes and we want to look at other stressors. That's kind of the bad news because then that means that when can we, can we end or when can we conclude? And perhaps if we do more and more and more, we can conclude and start to find more and more common factors like this, this authors did. And, and we also want, would like to see longer term follow-up, right? Because here, this is a follow-up of about um, nine years, as I was saying, but the study has more years in follow-up so that we could potentially look and examine what was the endurance of the negative effect of stressors or what actually what was the endurance or, or uh, the recovery, did it, did it actually stay? Up. And also this, this paper didn't examine disparities by gender and other potential bull number groups, but it could be done very easily. They probably have the ability to do that, present results in that way. But of course, these days, as Dr. Uh, Octavio Martinez was saying, we need to look at the diversity of population and, and tease out from the data who is more likely to, uh, to, be, uh, to become resilient or to have a successful aging uh, result. <laughs> And the next one, it's an interesting paper because I was looking for something economic, something that looked at the, the recovery from an economic shock or how a health shock could affect the, uh, the economic um, status or uh, conditions of people. And this is a paper that looks at the effects of a health shock on subsequent economic well-being. And it looks at income and wealth, you know, both types of economic well-being. It looks like a health shock for a variety of sources, I'm sorry, uh, income sources as well. So that you can think of if, if my income didn't change or, or it, it's because one type of income went up and another type of income went down. If you look at the different income sources, then you can see which ones are, are affected by a shock. Um, they also look at type of assets if they're, uh, you know, uh, financial assets, housing assets, and so on. And they look at by gender and vulnerable groups. The health shocks that they look at is with, whether there's a new diagnosis of chronic disease, a new cancer, new diabetes, new heart, lung, or stroke reported between 2001 and 2003. If there's a new one, then we look at and see what happened to the economic uh, status by 2012. This, this group, uh, uh, constructs treatment and control groups by looking at those who received the shock and those who didn't, uh, like I said, from uh, 2001 and three, the shock, and then 2001 and 12, the economic uh, well-being. The results are, again, that there's a negative impact, but the effects vary. The impact is on income and not on wealth. There's a lot of discussion of the nature of, of wealth and wealth accumulation in Mexico versus uh, in developed societies. And that may be the reason why this impact is of a health shock is mostly going to impact income. Um, the effects are mainly on labor income and not other kinds of income like pension or family income. And so that, that it's a, it's a sort of offers a clue of who's gonna affect, be affected more. The negative effects will, happen only for men, not for women, perhaps because this was labor income that was mostly affected by a health shock. Um, the larger effects happen for as predicted, uh, could be predicted, the most vulnerable groups, those who were least educated, those who lacked health insurance. And so this is a, a very interesting way of looking at who was affected 
what was affected, and so on. In conclusion, for me on this, uh, this kind of study, we also need more longitudinal studies of health shots on economic well being and not just on the other health outcomes uh, that it could affect. Um, this uh, emphasis on the economic well being may offer additional insight on who can bounce back. Because once the economy in the family economy or the personal economy is affected, then a lot of different uh, uh, bounces, uh, a lot of different effects can happen. The economic effect, uh, consequences of physical health shock, for example, may be an important source for added mental health problems. Um, the, the, what, what happened that the result was uh, noticeable for men but no women may mean that the safety nets of older women may be more diversified than those of older men. But in particular, this is an economic shock. And that's why perhaps women were protected. Um, and the idea and it was and a conclusion of the paper was that the adjustment to shocks by the larger network need to be studied because they cannot see whether the adult children were part of the, of the ones who protected, for example, the women. And, and so maybe that is, needs to be considered and could be examined with the MHAS data, but they didn't uh, include it in this paper. But as part of the richness of all the studies that they always tell us what they could have done, but they didn't have time to do it or space to do it here. So I, uh, in, in trying to understand where we are and where we're going and looked at this, the, the idea of this psychosocial well-being. Again, it, it's, I, I've talked to you mostly about income, wealth, uh, health, fall, widowhood, and so on. But it's, it's about this uh, resilience in the, in the, in the psychosocial well-being, in the social and psychological aspects of well-being that seem to play a major role in this, uh, in, in this resilience. And then, so there's life satisfaction, as I mentioned from the literature, sense of purpose, sense of having support, safety nets, in addition to depression and loneliness, there's other aspects that, that are intermediate or before we even get to depression or to feeling lonely. These are perceptions in various dimensions. And again, perceptions is one of those aspects that when you start launching a study, a large sur survey, you think about all these other things like income, wealth, number of diseases, number of visits to the doctor, how much did it cost, who paid for it, all, you know, all these other aspects. But perceptions at the beginning of the study when we started it in 2001, we thought that perceptions were very difficult to measure were perhaps not uh, worth measuring. The psychosocial uh, feel in, in, in survey research changed so much between now and, and between then in 2001 and now, that of course now we have a lot of perceptions in the study, a lot of psychosocial aspects. The, the feel of aging was changing and we were changing with it. The, the data collection changed with, with, the, with the feel. And so now we measure a lot of these in population-based studies of aging like the MHAS. For example, family and social network support in the MHAS is, is you measure perceived support and you, you take a score calculated using three components. You ask the respondent, if you were to need, can you, re, can you rely on friends of neighbors for daily errands? Can they go and buy you stuff? If you were to have a need, can you come with financial assistance for your expenses from someone? If needed, can someone count, can you count with on family and friends for your personal care? And so these are perceptions or potential needs that you might have and whether you would have support for these. And the score ranges from zero to three. And then I'm gonna just show a couple of uh, results that, that talk about the Mexican uh, population and how they respond to this next week. To this uh, questions, the family and social network support score, like I was saying, uh, ranges from zero to three, is very close to, to two, and it's lower for older in older age. They think that they have lower support in older age, but it's only significantly different uh, for women. Those who have age 70 and over say that they have less 
uh, support than those that are younger. This is the, uh, the number and uh, the vertical axis you see now, the number of chronic conditions among the seven majors, heart, cancer, lung disease, uh, diabetes, stroke. They, they have, if they have zero, one or two or more of these diseases and how they respond to having social network. And then we can see here, uh, the colors in the left is the percentage of people who have zero, one or two diseases. You see that 40% have zero of these major diseases, 30 plus uh, report one and about 27% report two or more. And you can see that on the right-hand axis is the, uh, the scale for social support. And you see that those who have more diseases actually are reporting having less uh, social network support. Then I'm gonna talk about the life satisfaction scale. This seems to be in the literature of resilience a lot. It appears and reappears. This we have in the MHAS the dinner satisfaction with life scale. It's again a perception, it's perceived satisfaction with life. And here the one I wanna present is the score constructing using the reverse code of the five components. The range is one to three. And the uh, spoiler of uh, alert is that there's very little variance. Very little variance in, in it's, it's at the high end. So satisfaction with life scale seems to be very high, higher for older adults, you know, with age, but in both genders, men and women. They declare to, to be satisfied with those five items that we asked them. And I, I want you to know that the, the results I'm showing are, are for the latest wave in 2018, but we went back and looked at uh, this in the past every wave every, uh, the Mexicans are reporting satisfaction with life very high. Now looking at how many diseases they have in the horizontal axis, if they have none, one, two or more, then you can see a little bit more and those who have more diseases are less satisfied with, with life. It's still the scale being um, zero to three and you still have you know, 2.6, 2.5. And, and it is different for those who have two or more, but they are, uh, pretty high in general. In conclusion, I, I, in this part, I would like to say the resilience research has been expanding to more dimensions and not only lack of illness, uh, psychosocial, science, uh, economic resources provide these safety nets that we're talking about. And the resources are intrinsic in the individual and external in the network, community, society levels and are acquired over the life force. The, all of this is, is what we have been talking about but this is data intensive research, it needs a lot of data, but I claim that the existing longitudinal databases fully support this work now. Now I wanna say a little bit about how we are preparing for the next generation of this line of research. Um, COVID-19, of course, provides a major, major generalized shock, right? And so we're, we were all looking at shocks, as, as, I, as I showed you, we were looking at reforms from uh, pensions, reforms from health insurance, uh, recession, and so on. We were ready and we were doing that kind of work, but now we get a major shock. And of course, we think that we are in a very good position, those who who were de collecting data in a longitudinal cohort, and now we have a shock, we have an opportunity. However, we have a huge challenge. We are gonna have people that are infected or were infected themselves and people who were affected. And so we're just gonna, and everybody was affected, to what extent and how they manifest that those consequences, those will need to be examined. And so this is a major challenge and, and we're gonna have a hard time differentiating um, the effects of say depression because that person has a, a very lonely or bad children or family life from COVID isolation. And so it's gonna be a challenge methodologically, but we think if we provide the data, the researchers will respond. The research using waves pre-COVID-19 is gonna be cleaner because it's not gonna be uh, contaminated by COVID. And so anything we do before COVID came is gonna have a lot, of, a, a lot of weight 
is going to have a lot of uh, gain. And so I think we should think about that and not just focus on after COVID. Think of what can we do with the clean waves before COVID and then launch to think about how we study the consequences of COVID. We're going to have an opportunity to test how various dimensions of resilience, the ones that you all will talk about in the rest of the conference, the ones that we already mentioned today, which ones operated prior to COVID and how they will work and for which outcomes post pandemic. Right there in that one sentence, it's about a 10 year research agenda for all of us. And so it's just so much to do and so much to cover and talk about different out the, the results are different for different outcomes for the stressor and so on. So it, it's gonna be uh, very interesting, but very challenging. So here, as I, when I show you the structural shocks that, that happened through the panel, now we added COVID-19. So we are gonna be able to study, as I said, we are in good position. This study has uh, examined people potentially for 17 years before COVID came. And so, and then we're gonna hopefully uh, examine them and, and be able to uh, look at their life and at all the dimensions we talked about post COVID with 2021 and the subsequent wave, hopefully in 2024. And so hopefully uh, the, 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 the program will be rolling, the, the program meaning COVID will be rolling and will be changing as well, and we'll be able to follow it. But the next slide, please. So I said, remember I showed you the, the slide that shows the aggregate data linked to the MHAS and we had all these other things, mortality rate, census, pollution, Seguro Popular programs and rollbacks but now we have COVID. And so we are preparing to gather the data, you know, the data has been gathered by the Mexican government and link it to uh, the MHAS individual data. And so there's a lot of potential there. Uh, we're gonna be looking at the quality of the data the project has just launched and looking at the quality of the data in the early times in 2020 and today, when we can see hospitalizations and each hospitalization has information about the patient that was hospitalized and characteristics. Again, we're going to look at the quality of data, but by the aggregate level, the county of where the MHAS individual lives, we can potentially also know the historical series between March, May 20, and now of the uh, what we call the, uh, the street light, right? That whether it was red light, yellow light, green light in the county we are able to construct that variable and, and, and uh, aggregate it to the, link it to the MHAS record. And so it will be a, a lot of potential data, but a, a lot of time that we, we are uh, investing in trying to provide more data and enrich the MHAS data to the point that all of that data we had before, then we can add the after. In conclusion, then again, more research is needed. Yeah, we we'll conclude on longitudinal analysis to think about how enduring is resilience. Um, and then we can, if we want to continue to study resilience, to scholars, I would say, start studying resilience without looking at COVID yet. Think about resilience, how do you measure, how you approach it, and, and what's the, the methodological challenge and how do you learn before versus after and, and those kinds of, of measures and those kinds of techniques, those kinds of hypotheses, how do you develop them, how do you test them? And then get ready because the COVID data is coming, right? And the after COVID data is coming. Which dimensions of resilience matter more? I think that we need answers in there. I mean, you know, so there's a, a lot of space to cover that. What matters more also, the objective or the subjective measures? So for example, what matters more? the actual safety net or the perceived ones? Does it matter that you have a certain income or does it matter that you feel that you are perfectly fine even if you have the low income? There's some papers, uh, some evidence uh, that I didn't present of uh, authors that have worked with the MHAS data where people who receive very little help from their children when they have ADL limitations, when they are asked, do you think that you, have, that you, you, you receive enough help not enough help or too much help. And people always say enough, enough help, it's okay. And it, it, then so why do Mexicans seem to be happy or more satisfied than their objective measures would indicate? I think this is a major area of research that we would like to see more people involved 
Is it a matter of the scales that are being used with the Mexican population? Or is it a matter of attitude, cultural, uh, like uh, Dr. Martinez was telling us, is the culture, this is the acculturation or the philosophy about uh, asking more than you can possibly have. So why would I think that my children are not giving me enough help? Well, that's all they can give me. So even if they give very little, it's enough. And so is that the same way they're answering when we ask them how satisfied they are with their life? And so that, that, that kind of research, I think it, it's, it's very important for the study of resilience. And I think uh, overall, and, and several authors said it, even in developed countries, we need to test more interventions that foster resilience and see if they work and if they don't, you know, how do we need to tweak them for older Mexicans and other underrepresented groups in health research that talk, that talk about how we can start to think with all the research that we've done that I've you know, just scratched the surface here. Uh, it's, it, what, how can we start um, forming interventions? Thank you. Next one, please. And I just want to, these are my acknowledgements that our collaborators for the MHAS is UTMB, the National Institute of Statistics in Mexico, the National Institute of Geriatrics in Mexico, Taub Institute in Colombia for anything that has to do with genetics, National Institute of Public Mexico, anything that has to do with biomarkers, UCLA, Fielding uh, and School of Public Health and acknowledging the grants. And these are acknowledging a large group of people, only a few that are really work very closely with all, all the things that I presented. And so thank you all. Next one, please. And I just want to give a message to the young scholars. And I, because sometimes when we are here in, in speaking to a screen, I don't even know who's there, right? But I'm gonna have to assume that there are young scholars out there, right? And Phil told me, Phil Cantu has been, you know, talking to us about participating and mentoring and whatnot. And they're young scholars and they want to hear what next, what is the, the next study, the research questions we should be ans asking. So I want to say that the shock was generalized. Right? If it not infected many of us, it affected all of us. Right? And so more data will be needed, no question. But we're getting ready. We're getting ready. And the whole time I try to emphasize that we're getting ready to give you more data. And so we need, as a collective group, we need to step up. We're going to have the data. Just you know, reach out to your mentors, your peers, your students. You, many of you already have students to work together and to you know, use the data more. Next, please. Thank you. That's it. Thank you so much, Dr. Wong. Uh, I, I can be in charge of the Q&A, so if anybody has any questions, uh, you can either put them in the chat or you can use the raise hand feature and I will call on you. It looks like we have a question here from uh, Dr. Brian Downer, are the COVID questions in the MHAS harmonized with the HRS and other studies? Yes, we, of course, as usual, the HRS has a much longer battery than ours, but we have common questions right? because the HRS started by interviewing people by phone. And then, you know, so they are able to do more things than we do in Mexico. It, the interviews have to do, have to be in person in their households. And so by, by uh, necessity, our batteries tend to be shorter. Oh, thank you, uh, Octavio. Thank you, Jackie. Uh, Rebecca, I had a question about the uh, perceived uh, support and the uh, life satisfaction question. Are those only uh, positive questions? Are there negative questions in there? Because what I've found looking at, at relationship questions in the Hispanic IPs, 
is that there's really little variation in positive questions, but you get much more variation in negative questions. So ne negative relationship questions about things that are people are dissatisfied with. Yeah, that's a possibility. The dinner battery of life satisfaction is very positive. I mean, all the items are positive, right? Uh, there's one that is, if I were to be born again, I would change almost nothing. That's positive, right? I've gotten important things out of my life. I'm satisfied with my life. Those are things that are very positive. In the other items of um, not life satisfaction, but the social network support is, um, if the respondent can rely on friends, can count with financial, and can count with family friends, there's a little less, it's a, it's a, it's a more not negative or positive, but just, you know, can you count on someone? And perhaps that's why we have more variance there. People may not have somebody to count on, um, right? There's, the, I mean, in the dinner, there's only one, I think, that, that needs to be reverse coded, but, uh, or all of them. I think they're all reverse coded, so it could be uh, life satisfaction. But yeah, that's a good question to explore. Well, if there are no other questions, we've got about five minutes. I would like to give people a little bit of break before we start the next session. So um, we will take five and we will be back at 2.30 for the session, Defining Resilience Conceptually. And, oh, there, there's one more question that came in real quickly um, that I would like to, to read. Um, regarding the effect of the context, structural shocks, on the trajectories of in participants, I believe it is an important and needed approach. Although I agree with the closing of programs and their associated bureaucracy, it is not that the support was eliminated. On the contrary, a modification of the Mexican constitution was promoted and approved so that social support programs, pensions for the older, scholarships for students, support for people with disabilities, have constitutional level and therefore national application directly to the registered beneficiaries. Why would this be considered a setback for social programs? Wouldn't that be the opposite of positive shock? Um, it, it may be, it, it, it may be um, from the perhaps long-term perspective, it may be from the perspective of the macro and what else is happening, but for individual families who were getting their check every month, and it, this is, this is a, a rollback in about 7 million households in, the, in, in Mexico, and this is about one-fourth of the Mexican population that will be affected, and, and that check of the anti-poverty program was about 20% of their income. So all of a sudden, you get a 20% of income and you income cut. You did not expect that. You know, it, it's probably going to be a shock for those families. I, like you said, I agree. It may be in the macro social society context. This all may be a, a good positive outcome in, in about five years, 10 years. I don't know how long it will take to implement that. But in, in the immediate effect was for the family. It was a negative shock. All right, so we will take a quick break. We'll be back in about three minutes. Uh, look forward to seeing everyone soon.
All right. Well, we are just about right back on time. So I will introduce our next uh, session, Defiling Resilience Conceptually and Methodologically. Our discussion for this section is Dr. Ladson Hinton from UC Davis. He is the Director of Geriatric Psychiatry. Uh, Dr. Hinton? Yes, uh, thank you very much. It's um, really a pleasure to be, be here virtually with you all. I wish it was in person. I've attended this meeting on a number of occasions in the past and, and have really enjoyed the you know, the face-to-face -face interaction, but, but um, I think this is really, this will be a terrific conference as well. Um, I wanted to thank the conference organizers for inviting me uh, to be a discussant. Um, you know, as I think Dr. Wong noted early in her presentation that resilience has not been kind of a major focus of her work. And I have to confess it has not been a major focus of my work uh, as well. But after hearing the presentations um, this morning uh, and also previewing the presentations in this session, session, which I think are terrific and complimentary, I think maybe I should have spent more of my time focused on resilience. So without further ado, I'd like to uh, introduce our first uh, speaker, uh, Luis Miguel Gutierrez Robledo who is the director of the Mexican National Institute of Geriatrics. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Latsan. And I will begin sharing my, my screen. And I want to thank you all to, for being here today and for allowing me to share with you this, uh, this minutes and and, and take advantage of this possibility to congratulate Jackie and, and thank her for all her efforts that make this meeting a, a success uh, for so many years uh, and, uh, and for those, that, those years that will come. So uh, after what we have heard from, uh, uh, from Octavio and, and Rebecca, it would be much easier for me to move forward. 50 years ago, George Kangihan Ward wrote his uh, he has PhD uh, dissertation. He was an MD and he became a philosopher in France. And in his definition of health, uh, his thesis was on the, uh, the normal and the pathological. And uh, he, he stated this uh, definition of, of health. And he said how it is, it is uh, characterized by normativity, not normality. So how the body adapts in permanence to the challenges that uh, that we suffer now, we call this allostasis. And how do we adapt to this uh, continuous permanent change is uh, the, the, the key idea of resilience from my perspective now, because I, I must admit that, that my thinking about this has evolved ever since, even since we published with John, John Holger, the, the paper that Rebecca referred to. But uh, one thing is for sure, resilience in old age is key for health. It is commonly envisioned as the ability to stand up or bounce back. But in fact, there is no universally agreed definition. And there are many more questions than, uh, than answers. Does it decline with age? Are older adults less resilient than the young people? Better health and well-being is associated with greater, greater resilience. Higher levels of social and communal interaction not always, as you have heard. Increased levels of spirituality may be associated, probably. Interventions to promote resilience must address the factors associated with resilience, but which are those factors? We still do not know for sure which factors are, uh, uh, amenable, uh, 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 are there that we can act upon. What is a resilience, even though there is some variation on how it is conceptualized? There are three common features that almost any definition embraces. There's a stressor, there is a response, and there is a mechanism behind. And, and in, in, any, in any of the different approaches that have been developed to address this, this issue. And two perspectives, at least, can be distinguished based on how resilience is thought to be expressed. And I will focus on, on these two uh, perspectives, and particularly in the newer one. <clears throat> the first, uh, the classical, the most widely applied, describes the expression of resilience as a positive response to a high intensity stressor, a fall, the loss uh, of uh, a spouse, 
But the second, the newer perspective is even more interesting. And it describes resilience in the context of responses relative to equilibrium. This ad continuous adaptation following low intensity everyday stressors. And almost all descriptions across the two perspectives describe the resilience mechanism to be dynamic and emphasize the importance of the context in achieving uh, resilience. And we have heard about it today. In the World Report on Aging and Health, for, uh, we have an example of, uh, of uh, resilience, but here it is uh, ambition at, at, this, at this single high level shock uh, uh, that happens once and, and people tend to recover or not, and they follow different trajectories. More recently, uh, Jeremy Walston and Linda Fritt published this paper in Nature Aging uh, early this year, where uh, they, they do not address resilience directly, but it, it is there behind in their reasoning. And it, 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 it is in this stress response dynamics and how it constitutes a, a barrier to impairment that is continuously uh, modulated during, uh, during our lifetime. And this is uh, the, the new uh, perspective that I, I want uh, to share with you and that I want to address today. <clears throat> so when we face a stressor, there are several possibilities. Since avoiding, avoidance would be the first, uh, how to avoid effectively this uh, stressor. But uh, if we have to face it, how do we do to return to the earlier level, or how do we take advantage of this, uh, st uh, this stressful event to uh, move uh, upwards to a higher level of functioning, which also happens, but it's not the more common response. Some people uh, like Resnick have addressed this, uh, this uh, issue from the health uh, uh, science perspective. But I, I believe that this perspective falls short and that we need a more broad perspective addressing the social determinants. And it, we cannot limit it only to the, to the health-related factors. It must be, I'm, I'm, I'm persuaded that it must be broader. Some other groups, for example, the British group that is developing the concept of frailty has uh, considered resilience within the framework for uh, the study, but also uh, from my point of view, they fall short. They, they only address resilience from the psychological perspective and not within the person where it should lie, but in, somewhere uh, around the, the, the individual. I don't think that it, this is the best way to, to address the, the issue. And they propose a brief resilience scale that focuses mainly on, on mental health and, uh, and, um, and locus of control. And I don't think that that is enough. There are much more domains to be considered. And I uh, uh, suggest uh, the audience to, uh, to read uh, this, uh, this paper, which is a focus group study, a, a, small, a, a small study, but very, very interesting for the issues that it raises the domains that we have to consider as a whole in order to better address this, uh, this uh, uh, issue. The concept, how to interpret it, how, uh, what, is, what is the added value of resilience? I think, I think it's clear for us all today and, and how it ends sometime and how it's finite. Then the a priori uh, or uh, the dynamic systems approaches, which are different, and I will go into that uh, uh, next. And how do we apply not only in research, but how, how do we begin to address it in order to introduce it in clinical practice, both from a medical perspective? Uh, Rebecca has already uh, talked a lot about the, 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 the different layers of resources and assets that could theoretically facilitate resilience. Uh, different authors have addressed this and have been able to uh, demonstrate how uh, high resources in the environment tend to uh, promote better trajectories and, and less impact of adverse uh, events. But uh, similarly, it is not always the, the case. And because, uh, it, the, in fact, this is 
much more complex and, and it must be uh, imbued with a life course perspective. It is not a once in a lifetime event. It is something that is happening uh, uh, continuously that, 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 that we face repeatedly. And in fact, if we go to the extreme that I was uh, talking about earlier, we face it every day in everyday stress and the allostasis that we are uh, facing and to which we are adapting in everyday life. And then the individual resources are expressed every day, modulated by social resources and facing the challenge, the challenges of the environment in different, in different uh, uh, levels. <clears throat> and there is from, from one uh, perspective, the perception of how it happens. And from the other, uh, and in another very different perspective is something that we probably do not perceive consciously, but the physiological impact that is there and, and is happening in, in uh, every day. I find particularly interesting, and maybe you, many of you know this, uh, this model that has been proposed by the National Academy of Sciences in the United States for the study of resilience. And, link, uh, and uh, uh, recently, uh, researchers in, in gerontology have proposed to adopt this, uh, this model, which I find very interesting, uh, this uh, disaster resilience model to uh, gerontology, modifying the trajectories, knowing that necessarily it goes down, but uh, otherwise uh, the, 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 the elements that integrate the, this model are extrapolable to, uh, to aging research. And uh, even Eklasa in uh, very recently in this paper in BMC Geriatrics has published the, the variables that uh, they consider uh, could, we could uh, we could take in, into uh, into account uh, for each of the uh, proposed domains very very specific uh, variables. Many of uh, many of uh, of them are available in databases like uh, like the 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 M has. <clears throat> well, I I, I uh, talked about two uh, approaches: the a priori approach, which is the more widespread, uh, the more the more often used. In, in which uh, the researchers define the two essential components of resilience, the stressor and, and an outcome, and try to understand the mechanism behind. And as to the subject, resilience is inferred based on this uh, definition. And uh, several examples have been discussed today, and the a priori approach has also been applied in various other empirical studies in, in older persons. And the other approach in which I want to focus is the dynamic systems approach, which has the underlying assumption that a person's reactions to daily hassles, perturbations, or stressors, the so-called micro-recoveries, give an impression of a person's overall capacity to recover, and we can test it with a continuous monitoring. This uh, could be captured by a monitoring of movement, by monitoring of health rate variance, or several other physiological variables that can be uh, recorded now with uh, many devices that have recently evolved and, and that uh, make part of our uh, everyday life, like the watch I am wearing, for example. This data can subsequently be plotted over time and specific mat uh, mathematically modeled patterns are characterized as resilient. Three data patterns are indica indicative of resilience, the so-called called dynamical indicators of resilience, low variance, low temporal autocorrelation, and low cross-correlation. For example, self-reported physical health of someone with high resilience will fluctuate less, will have low variance than in someone with a low level of resilience. And a shorter time to return to, equi to equilibrium following disruptions means a low temporal autocorrelation is also indicative of resilience. And finally, a low cross correlation entails that in resilient individuals, it is more difficult to uh, have impairments in other systems than the one that has been challenged. Uh, this is an example uh, also recently published by an European work about the dynamic uh, indicators of resilience from physiological time series. In this case, measuring the uh, loss of complexity that we observe through the monitoring of the variation of uh, the continuous variation of heart rate. 
And that is only one physiological measure that has been uh, studied, maybe the one that has been more broadly uh, studied. And uh, the a priori approach has several advantages. It is much more easy to, to, to put in place. Uh, it is easy to understand and translate to a, a specific intervention, uh, uh, but it is less flexible, is uh, predetermined by the stressor, is much judgmental. In the dyna dynamical systems approach, uh, it, we have uh, much more uh, variables that we may put into in, in place. It, uh, incorporates resistance and, and recovery, and, but it, it has the disadvantages as well, uh, specifically the intensive data collection, but uh, is, is sometimes and from, the, from a, uh, somehow it could be easier because you can, with less people, you can do more with more intensive uh, data collection in a smaller number of individuals. And I will not uh, talk uh, about uh, this paper that we published because uh, uh, Rebecca has already uh, discussed it. Uh, and it, it is uh, an example of the first approach. Uh, but uh, this, uh, this paper that has been uh, published very recently uh, introduces uh, this uh, new perspective monitoring during uh, a hospital stay, the heart rate and the physical activity and the mood of the individual several times during the, the day. And uh, we see uh, uh, the added value of these dynamical indicators of resilience through, uh, uh, through the results. They improve the predictive value of, uh, of, uh, of uh, the, the, uh, the, the recovery, the outcome that we are looking, uh, looking for. Measurements capturing the dynamic functioning of multiple physiological systems have this added value in assessing physical resilience in clinical practice. So both the concept of resilience and specifically the a priori and dynamical systems approaches are of value for aging research and older adult care practice. However, the current ambiguity surrounding the concept and application must be recognized and evidenced by the large number of different associations that we have seen with resilience. Much work is yet to be done before it can be delivered on the full potential of resilience in aging research and older adult care settings. And greater conceptual and operational clarity can be achieved through more qualitative studies as well. I, I believe that older persons themselves should be included in the, in the discussion and in their uh, perception, perceptions and points of view also considered. The specific value of the approaches can be explored further through empirical studies that work with both approaches side by side and combine them in different ways. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, um, Luis Miguel. That was a wonderful start to this uh, panel. And um, I wanted to actually ask, I'm sure there are a lot of questions. I think we'll wait until the end. Uh, and save a little bit of time for questions and, and answers. So I'd like to now move on to the second presentation um, in this session. And that will be given by Silvia Mejia from El Cajillo de la Frontera Norte, where she's a professor. And she'll be speaking about psychological correlates of cognitive resilience. Can you hear me now? We can, yes. Okay, okay. I think, uh, I think you may need to, um, though, move to uh, presentation mode on your uh, PowerPoint. Excuse me. Is it ready now? Yeah, great, yes. Okay, so uh, I wanna, first of all, thanks, uh, Jackie for the invitation. I'm very excited to participate once again in the meeting. Uh, I've been participated for, participating for many years and I'm very happy to do it today virtually. It's the first time I'm gonna participate virtually in this meeting for most of all, for most of us it's the same now, but it's quite weird to do it virtually after having a lot of fun when we get together. 
anyway, so I'm going to talk about psychological correlates of cognitive resilience. Uh, my, my presentation is divided into parts. The first part is about conceptualization and um, conceptualization. It moved. Can you see the whole screen or, or it's oh, again I think, small? I, I think you just shifted uh, back into oh, the oh, other okay, mode. So. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, okay. There you go, perfect. So when we think about cognitive resilience, we must think in two questions. The first one is, why some people can tolerate more age-related brain changes than others and maintain function. And the one related with Alzheimer's disease is why some individuals with Alzheimer's disease show few or no clinical symptoms of Alzheimer's disease during their time life, but have pathological diagnosis at autopsy. So these are the two questions. One related with brain changes and the other with pathological changes specifically related to Alzheimer's disease. In this slide, I want to bring your attention to the years of this set of publications where you can see that it's a 53 year period between the first publication and the last one that I just put into the slide, but maybe I'm lost and there are many others in 2021. But it, that 53 period year that has uh, occurred, it make us think that many things have happened and that we were at this point uh, dealing with several issues related to cognitive resilience different from conceptualization. But if you look at the titles of the papers published in the, uh, the latest papers, you can see that all of them deal with conceptualization. And most have these um, like contribution trying to clar clarify which concepts should be used and if you look quickly, you can see it's resistance, resilience, reserve, compensation, uh, maintenance, and all of them are related to cognitive resilience. So something is happening in, 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 in our, um, at this moment where everyone is turning back to the conceptualization issues. And the, the good news is that the NIA has an initiative that started in 2019 where they brought together a group of experts on cognitive resilience and they are all working together to find a consensus on the definitions for cognitive resilience and the measures that should be used in the research. And Obviously, most of these changes have to do with all the progress that has been occurring uh, in relation to the, to the uh, analysis of brain pathology and the access to imaging and all of that. That has made that all of these researchers are very excited of revisiting their concepts and uh, finally taking a their last, well, I don't know if it's the last, but maybe it's one of one big step uh, based on the consensus group. All these experts, because if you read the, the papers, if you read all the um, um, conferences they have in their work, in their website, the workshops that have occurred, all of them are discussing actively which concepts to use. And finally, they, get, they got to this point where resilience is considered a generic term comparing 
uh, excuse me, referring to multiple reserve related processes. And specifically these processes are the cognitive reserve, brain reserve and brain maintains. So these are the three concepts they have chosen to emphasize and work as a group and in which they are trying to reach some consensus. Cognitive reserve is defined as a property of the brain that allows for cognitive performance that is better than expected, giving the degree of life course related brain changes and brain injury or disease. Brain reserve is defined as the structural characteristics of the brain that allow some people to better cope with brain aging and pathology than others before clinical or cognitive changes emerge. These two first concepts are, 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 we are more familiar with them because we have been hearing them for many years. Uh, and the last one is the brain maintains concept, which refers to the relative absence over time of changes in neural resources or neuropathologic changes as determinant of preserved cognition in older age. So brain maintenance have also been named by other researchers as resistance. So it's resistance, brain maintenance, which are similar concepts and you can find them in the literature. But these uh, researchers have also proposed some ways to operationalize these concepts. And basically the, the operationalization process should lead to uh, guidelines for research that are very stringent and that would allow consensus and comparative research. And they are stringent because if you look at the measures which are included for each concept, all of them include a measure of brain disease, of brain changes, anatomical changes. So we are dealing with all this progress that has come to uh, enrich the analysis, but that are, are also, is, is also a limiting uh, activity because not all have access to this type of data. So for cognitive research, they propose to include three components of the, uh, to be measured, measures of life course related brain changes, injury or disease, like brain anatomical changes, markers of neurodegenerative disease, functional MRI, obviously a measure of cognition and the proxies for cognitive research. And the same, I'm not going to read all of them because it's more or less the same, but they are proposing uh, different components, which include, as I said at the beginning, uh, uh, um, for all of them, a measure of uh, brain changes, injury or disease. And they also propose this diagram process, uh, which include the moderators, the role of the moderators, in the relationship between all the components of cognitive aging. So the moderators are defined as individual differences due to innate or, or um, lifetime exposure factors, factors that are going to act upon this relation, for example, age and pathology. There's the moderators are gonna act in this relation or they can act in the relation between pathology and brain, how pathology affects brain it, 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 it structure or function. Between structure and function is, is in this relation, moderators can also act. And at the right side, we have the uh, relation of brain with cognition, behavior, and function, where uh, we are more used to work with our proxies for cognitive research acting to determine or to have a causal um, role be between changes in the brain and changes in cognition. The proxies of cognitive reserve most usually uh, uh, implemented in, uh, through the um, research, research are socio-behavioral proxies which include education, IQ, occupational complexity, leisure activity, physical activity, social networks. 
researchers from these groups say other exposures with which you think should be proved or should be incorporated into your designs because they may in part a cognitive research should be included and go ahead to do that to do it because this is part of what they are trying to uh, uh, to do to, to move people to try new things uh, following these uh, methodology very rigorous uh, for the study of of cognitive resilience and they point to two issues that are very important when we are using the proxies for cognitive reserve, these social behavioral proxies. And one is that summary measures, which are widely used, may share variants and fail to capture unique contribution of the individual exposures. So we, 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 we take into account a lot of proxies. We sum all of them and we talk about a summary measures for a summary measure for cognitive research, and that's a, a, an issue that you have to take into account. And the other one is the reverse causation. That is very important when we are talking about cognitive research because you can you can say that, for example, someone who has been engaged in in, in cognitive stimulation for many years, uh, if 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 um, dementia starts, this person is going to slow down in, their, in that type of activity. And finally, when you try to see how uh, engaging in cognitive stimulation help or not, you see that it was lower in, in these persons who were uh, in the prodromal phase of dementia, for example. Uh, Another set of proxies for cognitive reserve are the psychological proxies, uh, proxies which are, we know a lot about the, the role of depression in cognitive impairment, uh, the stress coping, and two other important um, psychological proxies are locus of control and personality traits. These two proxies have been not as widely used as depression and, and, as, and as stress, but have been used more in relation with the um, uh, changes in cognitive performance. And recently, personality traits have been used to analyze uh, if, if there's some, some of these personality traits that confer like a protection for people who are in risk of cognitive, if uh, risk of Alzheimer's disease. And in, in, in these personality traits, uh, the most widely used model is the five factors, the big five factors, which I enlisted in the figure on the right side, which have been analyzed and, and, and effect, and uh, it has been found that neuroticism and conscientiousness are the two uh, factors which are related with higher risk of cognitive um, impairment, neuro high neuroticism and low cons conscientiousness. And locus of control has been shown has shown that having external locus of control is associated with higher um, uh, cognitive impairment or higher risk of Alzheimer's disease. We we may we I have two minutes, so I'm gonna run because I wanted to show you some of two slides uh, of uh, work I've been doing with my collaborators, Joseph Sainz and Sadat Milani, Joseph from the University of South California and, my, and Sadat from UTMB. And what we wanted to do was to identify how locus of control and conscientiousness related to one's ability to overcome the effect of early life disadvantage. What we did was uh, based on markers of early life disadvantage uh, in the MHAS 2015 uh, data, we chose uh, all of those who were uh, related with conditions before age 10 and the education level of the parents and occupation. And we estimated uh, who were above the median. No, I'm gonna go back. We estimated first, the expected cognitive ability given these markers of early life disadvantages, disadvantages. And we identify a subsample 
who are expected to be in the lowest quartile of cognitive ability based on these uh, uh, early life disadvantage and selected those who were above the median, those who were in that lower quartile but had at the observed um, cognitive uh, performance was above the median. So these were like what we are showing with the arrow, these are the ones who are resilient. They are low, expected to be low uh, ability in cognition, but they are really high in cognition. What we found was that among those in the lowest, um, in the lowest quartile of expected cognitive ability, having a more internal locus of control or more conscientious personality were related with having above median cognitive ability. So that was the effect for the resilient uh, subsample. And potential mechanisms that may explain this effect are better health, behavior management of chronic condition, more effective stress coping, more agency and actively seeking opportunities to build cognitive reserve in those who have more internal locus of control and more conscientious personalities. Thank you very much. Terrific, thank, thank, you, thank so you so much. Um, I'd, I'd now like to uh, actually in, invite uh, the next speaker, um, uh, Sunshine Rote, who actually I had the pleasure of working with, um, you know, when we had a, a, a Rick Marr here at UC Davis, it's wonderful to see how her, her career has developed. She's at the University of Louisville, and she's going to be speaking about social aspects of resiliency, resiliency in a caregiving context. Hey, Watson, can you hear me? Are you able to hear I me? Yeah, I can. Sorry, yeah, it's like it's a little unstable. Oh, can you hear me? <laughs> you might want to put your slides in um, presentation mode. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much for the introduction, Watson, and thank you so much to the ICAA team for inviting me here today to present. Um, and I feel really lucky to present after, you know, Luis and Sylvia, I think this is a really nice compliment to their presentation. So Luis did a really wonderful job talking about different, you know, theories or perspe perspectives on resilience. Um, and Sylvia obviously was focusing on cognitive resilience. And um, in my presentation today, I'm going to be talking about the caregiving context. And so dementia is a, a huge uh, part of that context. So to start, um, so whenever we think about, you know, resilience, we usually think about in terms of caregiving coping. So that's how it really seems to be focused on in literature, right? So we have, like Luis described, a stressor, we have a response, and then we have these ameliorating factors, right, that can reduce the impact of the stressor on health. And so... Um, some of these ameliorating factors or, or stress, stress buffering factors are things like, you know, personality or psychological resources, of control or self-esteem. Um, and this presentation today, um, I'm not, not going to really talk about these psychological perspectives factors and support, which can influence or, or create resilience. Oh. So, um, so yeah, so in this caregiver stress and coping model, um, I saw Maria was on the call. Um, she was one, really the one that helped really explore the detail for Latino caregivers. Um, we look at primary stressors and these have to do with things um, inside the caregiving domain. Um, we look at secondary stressors. So these, this is the impact of primary stressors um, outside of the caregiving domain. So if you think about, you know, providing care, this can create stress in terms of, work life or, or other family obligations. Um, and then these all are, sorry, there's appraisals that influence whether it becomes stressful or not. Um, and so today I'm gonna to be focusing on more supportive factors or social factors that can then create more resilience. 
So the first, this first slide here is a research we um, I did with Cocos and Jackie, and we compared. Um, so this, these are Mexican American caregivers in Hispanic ethnies, and what we did was compare them uh, to caregivers in a national sample. So these are caregivers in the NSOC, which is the National Study of Caregiving, um, and the NSOC has a large um, sample of non-Latino white caregivers, African-American caregivers, but a smaller sample of Latino caregivers. So we really wanted to make comparisons with Hispanic EPIs to the national data set um, that didn't have really, if we look here, so these are um, very common primary stressors within the caregiving domain. So dementia is obviously a big stressor. Um, Living with the care uh, with the care recipient, so living with the older you're providing care for, and, and so here you can see that uh, Mexican American caregivers um, are more likely to report higher levels of caregiving stressors, right? Um, so this means more time is spent in these domains providing care, um, and so with that information, we also wanted to look. We've also looked at some secondary stressors. So secondary stressors, again, like those really clear with the data is that uh, Mexican American caregivers report more financial stra uh, strain than other groups. So this is the publication where we compared to the national the NSOC. Um, and we found that also financial strain is more consequential for Mexican American caregivers than it is um, for the other caregiving groups. Um, we've also documented in more qualitative research, in-depth research, um, looking at challenges in terms of the sandwich generation. So looking at challenges that caregivers face providing care to their own children, as well as, well as their aging parents. Um, and then we've also seen that a secondary structure that haven't really thought of too much uh, the older European. So Sunshine, I just wanted to let you know that we are kind of losing you at points. I'm, I'm not sure there's anything you can do on your end, but I just want to make you aware of that. Oh, so given these secondary um, <laughs> spotty internet. So I'm really sorry. Um, I can keep going or I can call in. Do you want me to, would that be better? Maybe I'll call in. Okay. I'll call in real quick. For someone who suggested if you turn, if you turn off your video, Sunshine, uh, that might help. Okay. So turn off your video that, and then maybe that'll. Okay. Is that helping any? Maybe. So far so good. <laughs> we'll see. Okay. Um, so yes, but whenever, oh. okay. So we're looking here at different um, sources of resilience. So one thing that we've noticed with this, so we noticed that Mexican American caregivers have you know high rates of stressors, both primary and secondary. Um, but we also noticed that there's low burden reported for this group. and many positive, uh, we wonder, you know, what is going on to, to help caregivers become more resilient, right? So what are some of the features of Mexican American caregivers who are providing care successfully um, in terms of be, moving beyond the individual context rather than focusing on, on individual adaptation, really focusing on the person in the environment? So the sources of resilience, you know, we've kind of discussed today. So we've had individual resilience um, within the caregiving domain, dyadic resilience. So this is really resilience um, in the relationship between the caregiver, older care recipient. Um, there's also family resilience, right? So um, there are certain factors that makes fa make families more resilient in the face of caregiving. Uh, there's neighborhood resilience and also structural resilience. So I'm going to talk about each of these really briefly. So here we, um, this is again from the comparison 
from Indian stock to the Hispanic guppies. Um, and we find that Mexican American caregivers um, report better relationship quality and less strain um, than um, uh, the non-Latino white caregivers. So we think that, you know, at this relationship level, this is really, really important and can be an important um, way to intervene with, with family caregivers. Oops. Sorry, this was the slide that was supposed to come before, um, before I went into the different sources of um, resiliency. Um, but here, yeah, this is what we we're talking about where Latino caregivers report many um, challenges, but also report many positive aspects. And so at the family level, what are some positive aspects that um, result in optimal caregiving? Um, one of them is familism. So most of the research has focused on familism. Um, but we know that this isn't always um, necessarily related to protective or is not always protective. It really is based on the level of support supported by the caregiver. So familism itself is a cultural construct. Um, can you still hear me lots of, or is it choppy? Uh, yeah, I think it's improved some. <laughs> sunshine, <so>. Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, uh, but it's also due to level of family support. So um, this research really focusing on familism, we really wanted to understand well, what type of support is available to Latino family caregivers. Um, and in one of our publications, we looked at qualitative data, really went into this into more detail. And this is with, with Ladson and, and with Jackie. Um, and so we found these three different types of family support that's commonly reported by dementia caregivers of Latina origin. And what we found is um, the first group, the most like exceptional has extensive support from family members. Um, and they really have formalized processes for creating um, like meetings and calendars of support. Um, and they also use formal support, which we found was really interesting. So um, they use utilize formal support to help um, in terms of family support of the older care recipient. Then we found these other two groups who really report limited uh, family support or lack of family support. Um, and this was really due to you know, either family members having challenges with dementia and this creating tense social situations or uh, kind of family members minimizing the level of impairment of the older adults. They didn't have to, you know, help caregiving. Um, and then we also found these other family work, other health demands that can impact, impact love, uh, family support. Um, so in terms of the neighborhood context, we, we've also looked at this as well. Um, this is from the Hispanic Epi's Caregiver Supplement. And here, what we're really showing is that so this is linked with census data looking at percent Spanish speaking in the neighborhood. And here we found that um, these you know, neighborhood factors have shown to be very protective for older adults, these cultural factors. Um, but we also have to show it's protective under high levels of neuropsychiatric expressions of dementia. Um, so things like wandering or, or agitation or, or aggression. Um, these neighborhood factors are really, really protective under high levels of those dementia symptoms um, for family caregiver mental health. We've also looked at like subjective factors of the neighborhood and how this impacts caregiver mental health. And we've also found um, that neighborhood cohesion uh, is related to a better caregiver health. Um, helpful neighbors and also neighbors that can be trusted are also related to uh, less depressive symptoms in Mexican-American caregivers. And we found that these um, factors seem, seem to be especially pronounced when caregivers live in like a separate home for, from the care recipient. And this kind of makes sense that, you know, providing care to someone that doesn't live with you, the neighborhood factors would be especially important, right, for your health and for for um, you know, your distress in terms of caregiving. Moving beyond the um, neighborhood factors, we've also looked at kind of more structural factors, right? So we've looked at um, availability of, of support services in terms of formal paid services. Um, and we've also looked at you know, some formal service use in the Hispanic Epi's caregiver supplement. Um, comparing caregivers to U.S. born versus caregivers to those born in Mexico. 
Um, and we found that while transportation services and day centers tend to be a little bit higher for caregivers of the Mexican born, we find that more service use is prevalent among the US, uh, caregivers to US born uh, older adults. Um, and we've also done some state comparisons in terms of availability of support. And so there are a lot of adult day centers around the US-Mexico border. Um, and this is what we think is accounting for this, this higher, not significant, higher use of day centers and, uh, for caregivers to Mexican born older adults. So overall, we know that uh, Mexican American caregivers report high demand, but low levels of burden and, and better mental health than other groups. Um, we wanted to look at differences uh, during the COVID pandemic. Um, and we looked with the end talking at COVID care, caregiving during COVID. Um, and we found that African American caregivers are reporting more strain during the COVID pandemic um, than non Latino white uh, caregivers. And so um, it'd be really interesting to see, you know, with the Hispanic EPI's caregiver data, we have information on the COVID on COVID nineteen and and challenges that caregivers face. So that'll be really, I think, illuminating and important to look to look at that data. Um, again, there's not so in terms of general caregiving, there is a lot of focus on individual sources of resilience, but in terms of the, the Mexican origin population, there isn't as much on this topic. Um, Resilience is also linked caregiver resilience to biological function and also re, uh, religious involvement. But again, among the Latino population, this, this permission is limited. So I think those would be really important next step in terms of, of caregiver uh, resilience. Thank you. Great, thanks, thanks so much, uh, Sunshine. And, you know, I think I'm gonna just give a, a few very high level sort of comments uh, to touch on some of the themes of these presentations and then open it up for questions. I, this has been a terrific panel and I really think that the presentations have complemented one another and I'm sure that you all have lots of questions and, and uh, but uh, I'll just make a few comments. Uh, first, uh, just to actually speak to uh, Louise's presentation, there's a lot to digest there. And I've learned a lot about resilience through that presentation. Um, but I want, and I wanted to just uh, highlight that really important distinction between a priori or kind of high intensity kind of stressors, you know, that model versus the dynamic uh, sort of model. And actually to, you know, I was just thinking that those might also be complementary. In other words, clinically as a psychiatrist, when I work with uh, patients, that you know, they may have had a really serious major stressor. And it's really interesting to see how people then, how that shapes their later response to kind of those low intensity stressors. So there just might be an interesting kind of connection between those two. Um, I really appreciated uh, you know, the emphasis on the, the socio-ecological model, really looking at different levels. And I think that was highlighted you know, by Dr. Martinez and his comments and, and Dr. Wong. I think that's so important to look not only at these multiple levels from the structural down to the biological, but also to strengthen our ability to look at the interaction between these. In other words, when you have a major sh a shock, like uh, you know, Dr. Wong, at the structural level, like Dr. Wong was kind of explaining, how does that reverberate through those different levels then to actually become part of one's biology, uh, if you will. So I think that's really one of the, the challenges is really looking at those interactions between different levels. Um, I think that, that, that your presentation also really highlighted for me something others also uh, emphasized, which is the need for longitudinal research. What we're looking at are really longitudinal relationships, and the more of that we can do, I, I think, I think the better to really enrich the field. Um, also, I think you you pointed it out at the very end that the field could probably really benefit from the strategic use of qualitative methods to really help us get a handle on some of the mechanisms. Um, and so, I think that that there's a lot of opportunity to do that. For example, in combination with ongoing epidemiologic studies to better understand mechanisms. And finally, um, something your presentation also, you know, Dr. Martinez and others sort of highlighted that this, but you know, what are, what is the low hanging fruit in terms of beginning to translate some of this knowledge into interventions? 
And can we move to intervention models in which we're both trying things out to see if they actually build on sort of resiliency models, but also use those interventions as an opportunity to learn more? And I'll, I'll just sort of stop there, but, but at any rate, thank you very much for that, that wonderful presentation. And Sylvia, your presentation I thought was terrific. I, I so appreciated, you know, you're talking about sort of that, the distinction between cognitive reserve, you know, brain reserve and, and, and brain maintenance. I, I think that that sort of grounding for this conference and for the, the conversations that follow over the next couple of days is just so important. Um, and that finding, you know, in your work in which you saw the potential buffering effect of locus of control and conscientiousness in terms of the buffering with respect to adverse experiences early sort of in the life course on later development of later um, cognitive functioning, that, that those uh, personality traits can be, you know, protective in a way, a, a form of kind of resilience I thought was really fascinating. It made me wonder about mechanisms and um, certainly there might be more distal kind of mechanisms that those operate you know, around the time of those stressors, but I also wonder about more proximal kinds of mechanisms. And so I think you know, as a clinician, when I talk with patients, I think you know, those that are better able to take care of their healthcare are often conscientious and they have sort of an internal locus of control. And so I just wondered whether or not, you know, what you might also be seeing there is the way in which um, those personality traits help one to, um, you know, to manage sort of health issues. The other thing I wondered about, uh, it'd be wonderful to have a sidebar with you about this, is whether that relationship between those personality factors and cognitive functioning was also true for the larger sample. So you pulled out a, a really at-risk group, but it would be interesting to see whether or not it was protective for others as well. So again, I really appreciated that, that talk. And finally, uh, certainly last but not least, uh, Sunshine, I really enjoyed, of course, with all my interest in caregiving, I, I was really intrigued by yours. And uh, I thought what was really impressive about your, your talk is you're really trying to push the field beyond just looking at at resilience in a kind of dyadic way or individual psychological way uh, and really looking at these other levels. And what I found really intriguing uh, in your findings was the relationship of sort of neighborhood characteristics on sort of stress in family caregivers caring for someone who has high levels of neuropsychiatric symptoms. And when you actually look at that, I mean, as a clinician, it made me feel very humble because often all I can offer patients is medications to help. They're not even FDA approved, maybe to help with behavioral problems or maybe connection with some, some local resources or non-pharmacologic -pharm approaches. But that impact of neighborhood is the most powerful medicine I've ever seen for helping with caregiver stress and, and uh, perhaps with neuropsychological symptoms as well. Um, my final comment is that just sort of speaking to sort of the field of sort of Latino health and aging and mental health, your project, all, your, your presentation also made me think about some of the work that actually uh, a guy by the name of Steve Lopez did together with actually some of it with Bill Vega, who I think is attending today on um, looking at expressed emotion and uh, the impact of that on course of illness and people who are living with schizophrenia. And the thing that I think he really highlighted in his work was the importance of what he called pro-social factors. So it's family warmth and positivity, especially in Latino families, in terms of actually having a positive impact uh, on sort of the, the course of symptoms and, and disability. So that is, I think, a nice example uh, from the mental health field of, of sort of that, of resilience uh, at the family level. So I'll stop there and uh, I hope we at least have a few moments for, for questions. Um, I think it is 1.30, 1, but um, so I don't know if we do or don't, but I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over to uh, Philippe. We'll, we'll do five minutes of questions real quickly. Um, so Brian Downer, Dr. Downer, I had a question for Sylvia and he said, I have a question about the analysis you showed at the end of your talk. Did participants who had high cognition scores and high expected cognition scores have similar personality characteristics to the participants who were identified as having cognitive resilience? Yeah, I have the table with the descriptives. We haven't done anything else 
more more in a in a casual explanation, but uh, those in the above uh, quadrant of the high cognitive performance have a little bit higher uh, internal locus of control and conscientiousness, but we don't have these comparison done. Yeah, thanks, Celia. And this is basically what uh, Dr. Hinn was talking about more elegantly about if those uh, personality traits, if they would be beneficial to cognition kind of just overall, um, yeah. but maybe particularly so in um, people with the, the, the disadvantages earlier in life. Yeah. That's yeah. a good question, Brian. And well, actually, yeah. we have looked at that in uh, some other analyses, and we did find that it was globally protective or was globally associated with better cognitive functioning. And interestingly, we kind of did a inverse kind of analysis where we look at people that were in the highest quartile of expected ability and looked at who are the ones that ended up below the median. And we saw the same, um, the inverse relationship for those um, for those personality factors. It was the people with the um, with the external locus of control and low conscientiousness that ended up below median despite having all of the advantages in early life, if that answers your question. Yeah, that's great, thank you. All right, then I- If I may? Yes. Yeah, because, uh, well, uh, Jackie um, uh, was uh, uh, raising a question in the, in the chat uh, relating to the low hanging fruit as uh, Matson uh, ask uh, in his comment, and I can think of of two, uh, maybe uh, interesting from different perspectives. One uh, has just been mentioned: locus of control, and interventions focusing on locus of control, like uh, tomando control, like the the, the, the chronic uh, disease management programs that are already uh, been that have already been tested, that are already in place, that the Pan American Health Organization is promoting in Latin America. And the assessment of that of those interventions, would, uh, I think that that would be very interesting. And there, there is very few information about the, the impact from this perspective. And the other one uh, has uh, there's already evidence uh, on cognitive resilience of the impact of physical exercise, of physical activity. And and I think that physical activity can uh, can take us further, not only cognitive resilience, but resilience uh, as a whole against frailty. For example, I think th those are the two uh, main uh, low hanging fruits interventions that we can easily put in place, or relatively easily put in place, and measure their impact. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Uh, thank you, everyone, so much for the, the great presentations and. Uh, really appreciate everybody's involvement in the first bit so the next next uh, item on our agenda is the emerging scholars mentoring session so for the next half hour there's going to be one-on-one -on -one mentoring sessions for uh poster presenters and emerging scholars and then we'll come back to the main room at 4 p.m for the emerging scholars to do brief introductions and quick presentations of their posters and then finally at 4 30 there's going to be a panel on funding for early career scholars with dr frank bandiera dr brian downer dr joseph signs and dr jackie on so uh if if you're not going to if you're not a part of the emerging scholar uh mentoring session you can come back at four o'clock um we should be bouncing out into the uh the breakout rooms for mentoring here in just a moment and that'll be about 25 minutes until until four o'clock when we come back together for the main so, so I see what happens next. Yeah. Okay, yeah.
Hello? Um, I believe everybody who's supposed to be in a mentoring room looks like they're in the right room. Let me double check though. Um, looks like uh, Fernando. Yeah, so everybody who is going to be in a mentoring room uh, reached out to me in the uh, and would have received an email this afternoon. Um, if you haven't received an email about a mentoring assignment, then uh, come back at four for the uh, early career uh, presentations, the, the the poster presentations, and then at four thirty we'll do our uh, funding panel. So thank you everyone so much for for joining us so far today. I look forward to seeing you back at four. Well, and to verify before you go, the funding because panel and the um, emerging scholars that will be at the same Zoom link, correct? And this one? Phil, this is Maria Aranda. You don't need me for anything, right? Uh, is someone speaking? It's me, Maria. Hi, my, my computer. <clears throat> if you don't need me for anything, I'll get off, okay? All right. <laughs> Hey, Phil, I'm not seeing uh, Joanna Fitzgibbons in here. She's supposed to be in a room with Fernando Rios Mena. Uh, you know, she she received an email earlier about it. I, I'm i not sure um, if, if she's not in there. I guess I guess we can tell Fernando he doesn't need to, to mentor then if she's not here. I'll keep it open for now and keep an eye on the. Yeah, I she, I saw her online earlier too. She was here throughout the entire. Uh, she may have just be having internet problems or something. I'll keep it open and keep an eye out. And and Phil, uh, while we're at it, did, did you make those assignments you asked me to join? I, I did. We ended up uh, having uh, a, a lot of medical students, so I figured it would be more beneficial for them to to Perfect. be with medical student or medical people. Wonderful. So we are just waiting for for 25 minutes for the the mentoring session to, to go on and then we'll have the uh, quick poster presentations and then the funding panel. He is in there. He's uh, in a, a mentoring session right now. Okay. The next thirty minutes. Great. Yeah. Okay. That would probably. Yeah, that would work because I'm I'm gonna be the one who's gonna be working on this. Um, I I saw him taking notes on this. Yeah, he he put um.
great. It looks like almost everyone is is uh, back in the main room. So I am going to uh, just go down the go down the list on the uh, poster presentations and ask if the, the person who's on in, in the list of the poster presentation is here to give a brief introduction of who they are, a, a brief overview of their poster, um, you know, a minute to a minute and a half, really quick elevator pitches so that people can get to know who all was on the poster session, um, even if we don't have a full poster session. So. The first poster at the top is Stephanie Grasso. Stephanie, are you uh, still with us? Hi there, I'm here. Uh, hi, Stephanie. Hi. So uh, if you wanna go and give sort of your, your one, one and a half minute elevator pitch of your poster and who you are. Absolutely. Hi, my name is Stephanie Grasso. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Texas at Austin in the speech language and hearing sciences department. Uh, my poster focuses on investigating the feasibility of speech and language intervention that we administered via teletherapy to Hispanic individuals presenting with a language prominent dementia. So specifically, we enrolled individuals who had primary progressive aphasia, which can be caused by Alzheimer's disease or frontotemporal dementia. And we developed a tailored intervention program to address their communicative needs. We administered this treatment using tele-based intervention um, in the era of COVID. And we found that individuals, because they were bilingual, we treated them in both Spanish or Castellano and Catalan. And what we observed is that they demonstrated robust and significant improvement following intervention. And they also reported on a perception scale, improved um, confidence in communication as did their care partners. So that's my pitch. And please uh, feel free to reach out if you'd like to talk more about this project. Thank you so much, Dr. Grasso. Uh, do you want Kim? Do you want Kim? Mm -hmm. My name is Jiwon Kim. I'm from the University of um, Texas at Austin. I'm a doctoral student. And my poster was on the longitudinal study of cognitive and IADL disab disablement among the oldest old Mexican Americans. And I used the HFEs um, to uh, uh, look at the longitudinal patterns of IADL disabilities in late life. And um, we used the latent transition analysis and revealed a very important intermediary at risk class of emerging dependence. And yeah, please also feel free to reach out um, if you have any questions about my poster. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jiwon. Juan Ventura. Ah, yes. Hi, so my name is Juan Ventura. I'm a second year medical student at the University of Texas Medical Branch at Galveston. During this past summer, I was fortunate enough to gain acceptance into the Medical Student Training and Aging Research Program, working under Al Sneed, and I was able to hone my research skills in that field. I learned that cognitive impairment is a health condition that increases in prevalence as we get older, and it affects more than 16 million adults over the age of 18. And while a lot of the past studies have observed a stable relationship between hand grip strength and cognitive decline, the majority of these studies were conducted in non-Hispanic participants, and usually the follow-ups were less than 10 years. So my project, using the Hispanic established population for epidemiological study of the elderly, was to examine the relationship between hand grip strength and cognitive decline in this population over 20 years. Ultimately, we did find that uh, the highest scoring quartile had a 6% reduction in developing cognitive impairment and also scored 0.1 when it's higher in the mini mental state exam per year than the lowest quartile. So these findings help highlight the importance of maintaining physical measurements like hand grip strength and can benefit future investigations into developing interventions and methods to decrease this rate of cognitive decline. Thank you. Thank you so much. Jose Dario Martinez Esquero. I believe you're muted. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Dario Martinez. I work at, as researcher technician at IMSS from Mexico at the uh, Epidemiological and Health Service Aging Area Unit. And the title of my work is Physical Performance and Telomer Length in Older Mexicans. We uh, invited 
participants from the Cofoma court uh, at Mexico. He, um, those who agreed to participate were assessed for physical performance with the short physical performance battery and subdivided in groups with low and high performance, as well as we measure the, their telomere length and divided them by short and long telomeres. Uh, and we observed a significant shorter telomeres in those older people who have uh, low physical performance compared to high physical performance. So um, we think that this is implementation of the longer length assessment uh, could work as a possible biomarker for differential diagnosis on healthy and unhealthy aging. Thanks everyone. Thank you so much, Jason Castillo. Yeah, so my name is Jason Castillo, and I'm a Master of Public Affairs student at the University of Texas at Austin. And for my poster, I wanted to compare Medicaid long-term services and support in Texas and California um, and examine how they operate for people enrolled in Medicaid. Uh, I chose these states because they're confronting the same three demographic shifts, a rapidly growing Mexican-American population, a large proportion of low-income seniors, an increased prevalence of cognitive impairment, no dementia, and dementia among aging Mexican Americans. And also these states differ very much politically. And so their Medicaid programs serve patients' needs in different ways. And ultimately, I wanted to find cost beneficial alternatives to care for low income Medicare beneficiaries, including individuals with dementia. In doing this, I looked at enacted state budgets, reported data data from each state's Medicaid programs and interviews with members of state agencies and nonprofits, among others. Uh, both states are looking to transform their Medicaid programs in the coming years. So I think this topic is going to be relevant for policymakers who are implementing these changes. Thank you, Jason. Uh, Elizabeth Munoz. Hi, everyone. My name is Elisto. I'm Elizabeth Munoz. Um, I'm an assistant professor at UT Austin in human development and family sciences. And um, in my project, um, we were interested in looking at the trajectory of uh, perceptions of discrimination um, across 12 years. So um, I guess there's not a lot of um, a lot of literature out there um, showing the trajectories of discrimination. So we wanted to see how they changed and how those, those trajectories may be linked with cognition. So um, we use data from um, a little over a thousand uh, individuals of Mexican origin living in California. And we found a uh, that overall perceptions of discrimination declined across time, but that there was a lot of variability in the trajectories and we found two groups. So one group that was stable throughout time and one group that was high and declining. And the high declining group was the group that had lower cognitive performance. And it was also differentiated by being the participants who were born in the US and not Mexico. Um, and they were primarily English speaking individuals. Um, and so, yeah, that was my finding. Thank you. Thank you. Chenadu. Chenadu? Yes, yeah, somewhere right here. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Chinadu Omadeva. I'm a second year uh, medical student here at UTMB. And for my project, I work with uh, Dr. Milani to examine the relationship between uh, diabetes complications, such as um, eye complications, kidney complications, issues with circulations and amputations, and um, pain over uh, a 12 year follow up period um, with the HEPZ data. Uh, so I was looking at um, Mexican American populations aged uh, 65 and older. Uh, we're looking at them without pain at baseline. And uh, we found that after controlling for all the corporates, um, those with diabetes complications were found to have significantly higher odds of developing pain um, during this uh, 12 year period. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Xiaoying Yu. 
Hi, uh, this is Xiaoying Yu. Uh, actually, I'm uh, a statistician in the uh, Office of Biostatistics in the Department of uh, uh, Preventive Medicine and the Population Health. Um, actually, I'm very interested in the HIV research, and my poster is focusing uh, to assess the uh, race as these disparities in the incidence of depression among the older HIV infected and those uninfected uh, matched Medicare enrollees. So, and uh, actually uh, before this study, I did some other studies and uh, identified uh, there are many chronic conditions is highly prevalent in the HIV patient, especially for the uh, depression. And, but there's uh, really uh, have um, got, uh, literatures to focusing on um, to study the incidence and correlates uh, of depression and the uh, race ethnicity uh, differences in the older Medicare uh, benefits with newly diagnosed HIV and prevalent HIV and compared to those not uh, infected. So this study is to assess the effect of HIV infection and the race and ethnicity disparities on the risk of developing depression among older adults. I mean, um, uh, uh, older than 65 years old. So we basically construct uh, uh, a retrospective matched cohort study uh, using a 5% nationally representative sample of the Medicare uh, beneficial enrollees. So we matched uh, each individual with incident HIV, prevalent HIV to, to the, uh, uh, their uh, uninfected uh, individuals. So up to three uh, for, uh, controls. Then we're using the uh, computer risk model to study the um, uh, risk of the HIV infection and uh, also um, differentiated so the newly diagnosis and the prevalent and see how that uh, increase the risk of depression. And further, we look at the, um, uh, uh, how the race ethnicity interact with HIV infection um, on the risk. Actually, we did find the HIV infection increased the risk of the, the uh, uh, depression and within the five years and the Hispanic older Medicare use have even higher risk and among those newly diagnosed uh, uh, patients. So this actually uh, support a need for more tailored mental health screening and the treatment among this uh, particular population. So um, this is all, and I welcome any comments, suggestions, and happy to discuss. Great, thank, thank you, Dr. Yu. Uh, Conwell Con Moment? Hi, yes, um, my name is Kabul Momin, and I'm a second year medical student here at UTMB also. I worked with Dr. Milani and we looked at um, how sleep problems are associated with the development of obesity in Mexican adults aged 50 and older. So sleep is a largely modifiable risk factor uh, that predisposes individuals to chronic diseases, yet it's rarely ever addressed as a point of intervention by physicians and the community alike. And especially in older age, sleep becomes increasingly critical to monitor, especially um, in women as their circadian rhythms shift. So we wanted to examine this association, especially since Mexico has some of the highest documented rates of obesity worldwide. Um, and obesity is associated with an increased risk in chronic cardiovascular disease, as well as decreased mental acuity. So using the MHOS, we were able to see that um, for every increase in sleep problems uh, reported by by the response in the MHOS, the odds of developing obesity did increase by 6%, and this was accentuated in the female population. Great. Cheyenne Barba? All right, moving on. Lillian Lule? Okay. Erin Ballard? Hi everyone. My name is Erin Ballard. I'm at the I'm at the University of Alabama, Birmingham. I'm a graduate student here, and we were interested in looking at how living alone was related to cognitive and mental health in a group of Puerto Rican older adults um, from the Preco's study from 2002 to 2003, 2006 to 2007. We looked at how um, we looked at their cognition through the mini mental caban and we looked at depressive symptoms through a modified version of the geriatric depression scale and we just asked them whether or not they lived alone. Essentially, we found that cognitive decline was not associated with living alone um, in our regression models, but depressive symptoms were. 
But more like specifically, we looked at living situation and how that changed over four years. We found that individuals who weren't living alone, who started to live with someone else, actually had a higher rate of cognitive decline than other individuals. And so this is important because we're uh, experiencing there's a lot of um, migration out of Puerto Rico right now. And so there's like a reduced availability of extended family to take care of elderly individuals with cognitive decline. Thank you. Uh, Gladys Marian Baz Servent. Okay, Isabel uh, Garcia. Hi everyone, my name is Isabel Garcia Valdivia. I'm a PhD candidate in sociology at UC Berkeley. And for the poster, what I looked at was um, trying to see the effects of um, immigration status, particularly the fear of deportation or the threat of deportation in the late later years. Um, so I found um, that the literature emphasized that um, immigration status affects um, immigrants generally because, or the, the threat of deportation because it's a function of temporal geographic context, because of race or gender, as well as strategic um, behaviors. So I argue in here, I argue in this paper or this part of the dissertation that the visibility and fear of deportation is also a function of the life course that get, getting older changes how older adults think about the threat of deportation. Um, and I show, and we can talk more later if anyone discuss the different ways that it has changed. Thank you. All right, Sadaf Malani. Hi everyone, my name is Sadaf Mwani and I'm an assistant professor at the University of Texas Medical Branch and I'm in the Department of Internal Medicine. Uh, so for this project, we use data from the Mexican Health and Aging Study to compare persistent pain, which was defined as moderate or severe pain reported at two consecutive time points between two non-overlapping cohorts of adults by gender. Our two cohorts were those aged 60 to 71 years in 2001 and those of the same age in 2012. Uh, and between 2001 and 2012, many changes happened in Mexico, including increases in education, obesity and diabetes, as well as the adoption of a universal health insurance program. And so we found that while the risk of non-persistent pain decreased from 2001 to 2012, the burden of persistent pain did not change. And the decrease in non-persistent pain, which is a proxy for acute pain, may reflect the adoption of universal health insurance and access, uh, an increase in access to care. Lastly, in both cohorts, women had over 1.5 times the risk of persistent pain compared to men, underscoring the importance of addressing gender disparities in pain among Mexican adults. So feel free to reach out to me with any questions. Thanks. Yejin uh, King. Mm -hmm. Hi everyone, my name is Yejin Kang and I'm a third year PhD student here at UTMB. Uh, this was my class project last semester with Dr. Kantu and Mercedes. So many of you be aware that Hispanic older adults have a high burden of autosomal disease. And at the same time, a lot of you may also be aware that Hispanics are highly religious. So my research is trying to find the association between religious attendance and the risk for cognitive impairment among older Mexican Almost all the risk can occur on eight year follow up using, on eight, using the HVs. The findings show that um, older adults who attend religious service more than once per week have a lower risk of cognitive impairment compared with those who never attend. However, this advantage diminished once social demographic and health related variables are controlled. So future research is necessary to explore the potential role of other factors factors such as social cohesion and financial strains on this relationship. Please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. Thank you. Great. Melanie Placencia. Hi, everyone. My name is Melanie Placencia, and I'm a PhD candidate in the Department of Ethnic Studies at UC Berkeley and the Cesar Chavez Fellow at Dartmouth College. My poster is titled Age Friendly is Tranquilo Ambiente, How Sociocultural Perspectives shape the lived environment of Latinx older adults. And um, my research asked the question of how older Latinos envision an age-friendly community. And I did this work ethnographically for two years in an ethnic enclave near New York City that is considered to be an age-friendly destination and also via 72 semi-structured interviews. The study extends prior research that has largely considered structural economic components to show how cult, um, where, um, components of age-friendly environment and I, um, extend this to think about culture and how that might influence the well-being of older Latinxes, even if living in an under-resourced area. 
Findings led to the development of this concept um, described by several of the participants, an ambiente tranquilo or tranquilo ambiente, uh, which uh, translates in English to a tranquil environment. Uh, and I and I use this concept then to describe uh, age friendly and age friendly environment on the terms of older Latin nexus. Uh, and this con what's interesting about this concept is that tranquil environment you think this means a calm and quiet place but it actually is very much not the case they're interested in um, relationships and certain kinds of places and cultural accessibility um, and certain kinds of events and so what i'm hoping to what, what i'm hoping to do in this paper and in a larger conversation uh, in the scholarship is look at how there is structural but also cultural and geographical elements that influence kind of a latinx understanding of what an age-friendly community is and um, uh, in the sense, the tranquilo ambiente concept is highlighting how there is physical elements, obviously, um, in the literature, such as kind of well-lit and newly paved streets, but also social aspects, which um, like a community center and Latinx events that happen monthly, for example, um, in this particular community. Um, and then cultural events um, that promote heritage and also cultural material elements, such as bodegas or supermarkets and other accessible materials. and all those kinds of elements that kind of create this tranquilo ambiente that several of the participants mentioned. Um, and then the policy implications of the study is sort of um, the importance of long-term affordable housing because a lot of uh, older Latinxes that live in um, appreciate that live in uh, the community that I studied, and you know, I believe this is also applicable to other uh, geographic locations. They live in areas that are being gentrified um, or in ethnic enclaves that are where they're being pushed out. But these are places of familiarity, familiarity with them, and so they would like to stay in these communities. So, uh, policy implication is a better affordable housing, and also um, this has been mentioned in. Uh, um, uh, literature in the past, but uh, the promotora model, I think, uh, is really a great idea. Um, and I think that that also lends itself to not just public health, but thinking about age friendly promotoras and kind of how they could um, channel information on insurance, citizenship, federal programming, food, furniture, etc. Um, and that's sort of my project. And um, a selfish plug, this paper was published three days ago um, in the gerontologist. So um, if um, if anyone's interested, I can send you that. Okay, That's thank you. <laughs> Alan, Villarreal Reserve, last but not least. Yes, hello everybody, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Alan Villarreal Rizzo and I'm a second year medical student at UT Medical Branch in Galveston. And I work with doc Dr. Brian Downer in this project, which is, uh, we basically use the data from the Hispanic EPIs, which is a cohort of older Mexican American adults uh, and we examine the association between late life alcohol consumption and 10 year incident dementia. Uh, we divided participants into three groups based on alcohol consumption. Uh, these were lifelong abstainers, former drinkers and current drinkers. And our results show that current drinkers had a significant lower risk for developing dementia over the next 10 years uh, when compared to life abstainers, even after adjusting for demographic and health characteristics. Uh, so thank you everybody for giving me the opportunity to share the results today and please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. Thank you. Great. Thank you all so much for your, your quick sort of one minute presentations. Uh, you are, all of your posters were reviewed by a poster review committee and so you'll be getting at least two detailed feedbacks on your posters on, on your project um, and hopefully over the next day we can uh, get some of the uh, conference participants to take some time to look at your posters and send feedback as well. Um, but I think this is a, a really great crop of posters and I really appreciate all the hard work that everyone's done on it. So we've got a little bit extra time, but I think we should just move right on into our panel um, by Dr. Frank Bandiera, Dr. Brian Downer, Dr. Joseph Sines, and Dr. Jackie Onhel. So uh, if you don't mind, Frank, uh, you can uh, start the panel. Yeah, hi, I'm Frank Bandera. So this session is about 30 minutes. It's on tips on funding and mentorship. So we have uh, three speakers today. They will each give a brief presentation for about five minutes. And we'll leave the questions and answers for the very end. Uh, so we have three speakers. Uh, the first one is Jackie Anhed. She's the Wilbur Cohen Professor of Health and Social Policy and Professor of Sociology and Public Affairs at, at the University of Texas 
at Austin and a faculty affiliate at the Texas Aging and Longevity Center at the PRC Center on Aging and Population Sciences. Dr. Angel's research examines health and retirement issues with a focus on Latino aging, family, immigration processes, and community-based long-term care systems. And she'll be our first speaker. Our second speaker is Dr. Brian Downer. He's an associate professor in the Department of Nutrition, Metabolism, and Rehabilitation Sciences at UCMB. His research interests include the epidemiology of, of dementia and cognitive decline in diverse populations and the healthcare utilization of older adults with and without dementia. And our last and third speaker is Dr. Joseph Sainz, who's an assistant professor in gerontology at the University of Southern California and the Leonard and Sophie Davis Early Career Chair in Minority Aging. He focuses his research on both understanding and explaining disparities in late life cognitive aging, cognitive impairment, and dementia among older adults in Mexico and Mexican Americans in the US. So, before I get into the speakers, I wanted to give a brief presentation myself. Uh, I'm at the National Institute of Aging, I'm a program officer, and uh, I'm going to share my PowerPoint here. You see it there? Yes. Okay. All right. So I'll talk briefly first on my background and uh, what a program officer is and how to best interact with the program officer. And I'm in the Division of Behavioral and Social Research at the National Institute of Aging. So this is me, I'm a program official. Uh, my a program official, I'll get into what that is later. But, uh, I, my portfolio is mostly on the social epidemiology of racial ethnic disparities and minority health and immigration. I'm the branch lead for the Research Centers for Minority Aging and Research, or the RICMARS, for my division, the Division of Behavioral and Social Research, or BSR. And my branch is the Population Social Processes Branch, or PSP. And previously, I was faculty at the University of Texas. So what uh, is a program official and what does the NI Division of Behavioral and Social Research, or BSR, do? A program official is a health scientist administrator. So basically, we're in the extramural program. So at NIH, there's an intramural program and there's an extramural program. The intramural program is the, the section that does research, and the extramural program is the the branch that gives out the money. So basically, it, um, we administer grants on behavior and social research and life course health and aging, mostly through grants to academic institutions, although we also fund uh, small businesses. We, our division funds social, behavioral, and economic research and training on the processes of it at the individual and the societal level. So we, we, in terms of research, we have our grants. We have, in terms of training, we have early career awards, such as K awards, uh, diversity supplements. Uh, we have four divisions at NIA. Uh, we have a clinical division, a division of aging biology, a division of neuroscience, and our division. And our division, we're interested in cross-disciplinary research at multiple levels from genetics to comparative research. And at NIA, a lot of our money is focused on Alzheimer's and related dementias in addition to general aging. So I should know before I get into this that, um, that I, I'm the program officer for this uh, conference and for the Texas Rick Bar. But I should mention that uh, if you're a junior investigator, this is an excellent way to get paired up with senior mentors. Uh, you can write pilot projects to the Rick Bar. 
you can meet senior investigators at these meetings. Uh, they have a bunch of data, like the Hispanic Epi study, the MHAS. So uh, you, you could write a bunch of papers with them, write grants, uh, get letters of recommendation. So this is a great place to network. So you're at the right place. So how best to work with a program officer? Uh, a program officer uh, could tell you what our, our priorities are and for each division. And there's a bunch of different funding announcements. So before you apply to one, you can contact a, a and we usually write this ourselves. So, you know, we're the authors of this. So you could ask us if your application fits the funding announcement. And we could help you refine the scope of your project so it fits the program announcement. If not, we could find the program announcement that fits your project. Uh, we attend reviews and we and if you get reviewed, we could comment on your resubmission. So uh, before you contact us, you should go on our website and, and we're a pretty transparent institute. All our pay lines are public. Our, our workshops are public. Our everything's public. Uh, before you contact us, you should send us your specific aims and you should tell us which funding announcement you're applying to. Uh, if you get reviewed, you should wait until you get a summary statement and send us a response of how you plan on resubmitting your grant. So before you apply, as I mentioned, um, you could send us a well, one page draft your specific aims, then schedule a meeting and, and go over your aims. After review, you could talk to us about your funding opportunity, funding chances, and also if you wish to resubmit uh, an approach to best resubmit and respond to the summary statement. So everything's uh, on our website, our meetings and workshops. Our workshops usually lead, lead to funding announcements. Our strategic directions are on our websites and our Alzheimer's implementation milestones are on our website. So that's all I have. Uh, I'll stop now. And our first speaker will be Dr. Anhen. Our second speaker will be Dr. Downer. And our third speaker will be Dr. Science. They'll speak for about five minutes each. And then when they're done, we'll open it up for question and answer. Thank you, uh, Dr. Anhen. Super, Dr. Bandiera, thank you. Just briefly, I want to just sort of echo everything that um, Dr. Bandi, Bandiera said, uh, but underscore some points. I served for, and serving for several years as not only on study section, but also as chair, you know, reviewing hundreds of, of proposals over the, over the four years, plus special emphasis panels. So I have um, sort of a perspective on what sort of the elements of, of, a, of a successful proposal. With all that said, in terms of the strategy for unlocking the door uh, to successful funding, I did wanna, um, again, just point out a couple of things. First of all, some of you may have been um, in graduate school and some of you are still there. Um, sort of socialized to, to work independently, especially for your dissertation. The field of aging um, and the behavioral social sciences increasingly requires collaboration and team efforts. And that is not to say uh, there are K awards where you'll, you'll work independently, but this whole idea of collaboration and teamwork, I think is a critical aspect to a successful proposal. And I think if we did a study on this, we would find that those who have not only been done in a, lab, a, a laboratory and with teamwork, but also those who um, have had the mentorship uh, to know when they're evaluating the proposals, other experts in the field um, being able to provide a feedback Feedback's important. Sometimes you may not want to, to um, you know, it might be hard to 
process, but in the end, it's going to be just critical. And um, clearly NIA wants to see that uh, in if your proposal is not initially funded. So teamwork, collaboration, um, it's a process, it's a journey that you're on. Um, many of you here have been extremely successful and our, our ICA emerging scholars and early investigators are just, again, um, really have knocked it out of the park. Well, with that said, uh, it does take a lot of diligence. So if, um, if it doesn't work the first time, if it doesn't work the second time, that means you'll need to sort of step back, reflect, and again, turn to your colleagues, turn to um, your program officer for guidance, right? Before you uh, go further. Other elements here is to really take some time away. Uh, once you get the score, um, if it's funded, of course, uh, you know, it takes a little bit of time to see what that funding range is, but um, don't give up. You know, it, it's, uh, it's very important to stay true to your, your intellectual um, compass in terms of the ideas you want to pursue. With that said, there's special calls for proposals and for applications such as dementia, which is such a critical issue as, as we know, uh, and likely dementia and cognitive impairment and cognitive aging that we really need to, in that type of team where, where it may be out of the scope of your expertise, it's time to partner. And you've even heard today how leaders in our field have intellectually stretched to be able to better understand these important concepts and are again, collaborating with one another. So uh, in summary, think about also in terms of your career trajectory, short-term, long-term goals, RO3 mechanisms are a perfect way to um, get your R01 eventually funded or an R21 um, and to work with others to get that, that feedback and uh, definitely uh, talk to your program officer along the way and develop a great relationship. I'll stop there. Okay, thanks, Dr. Downer. Yeah, thanks. Uh... Thanks, Frank. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. Um, so yeah, for the next five minutes, I was going to talk a little bit about uh, my own experiences submitting a K award um, and how that compares to submitting an R award and kind of walking you through maybe some of the important decisions that need to be made when deciding if you want to submit a K versus, versus an R award. Um, so first, just in case you're not familiar, so a K award, as Jackie mentioned, is an individual career development award. Um, it's typically meant for early career faculty as a way to uh, receive additional training, whether to expand on their previous training or to shift to a new area um, of research. Um, they're attractive for a lot of reasons. Uh, one of the added benefits is that you're allowed to commit at least 75% as a minimum to your research and training activities. Um, so it's a really nice way to um, develop some of that protected um, research time. Um, the R01, that's the kind of major research grant, um, typically five years of research funding. Um, it can be anywhere from a few hundred thousand dollars up to a few million dollars. Um, so these are the kind of the big ticket items that, um, that we're all um, uh, striving for. So yeah, so just to kind of highlight a few of the um, kind of major, um, you know, kind of comparing and contrasting when kind of going through the K award versus the R award. So the approaches to these two grants, in my experience, were very, very different. So for the K award, um, it's basically an NIH investment in you as a scholar and your potential as a uh, future scientist um, compared to an R award where it's an NIH investment in your research and there it's how is your research going to benefit um, the, the health of the, of the community. Um, so that really needs to be factored, factored into kind of your key message that you're trying to get across to reviewers. So the key message for the K award is you're basically selling yourself um, and you're selling your potential to become a uh, successful uh, independent um, scientist. And you really need to give a compelling and convincing reason for why you need 
more training. You know, for many of us, we've already gone through undergrad, maybe a master's, PhD, MD. So you're now requesting an additional five years of kind of protected research and training time. And so you need to give good reason for why you need that, need that training. Um, for the R award, it's entirely about selling your research. So you need to develop, you know, compelling um, and significant innovative specific aims um, and really convincing the reviewers that your, your research is um, significant and innovative. Um, for kind of the important component, so for the K award, since you're selling yourself and you're selling yourself from a training perspective, in my experience, the training portion of the K award is, um, the, I think, the most important, in addition to kind of describing the, your, yourself as a candidate and why you need that training. Um, so I think having a really well thought out and well developed training plan is absolutely critical. Um, so the K award also includes a research portion with specific aims and a specific research project, but there it's not so much as creating like an R01 level project. Um, you know, the research portion of a K award should complement your training plan and really be where you apply the skills that you're learning and the training that you're receiving that should be applied through the research project. Um, Whereas for the R award, obviously there, the, the main message and the most critical portion is the research. So in addition to the research being significant, you know, addressing a major gap um, and innovative, you know, doing it in a new way, you need to describe those method, methods really, really clearly. So the approach section um, needs to be really, um, really well done. Um, the last point I wanted to make is kind of going back maybe to the beginning. So deciding, okay, do I want to apply for a K award or do I want to apply for an R award? So I think for the K award, you really need to think carefully about, do I need more training or do I want more training? Um, if you're moving into a new area of research and it's maybe a substantial change from what you were previously doing as a graduate student or as a postdoc, and you're at an institution that's well suited to support K awardees and you have a strong mentoring team, you know, then I think it would make a lot of sense to take the time and effort to write a K award. Um, however, if you feel like you are um, confident in your research training and you're interested in pursuing research topics that are well aligned with your research expertise, you know, then I think it would make more sense to consider submitting an R01, maybe an R03, an R21, a smaller grant, um, if, if, you, if you don't feel like you have an R01 level project quite yet. Um, and there it's you know, just a matter of determining, do I have the right expertise? And if not, Am I able to identify people at my institu institution or an outside institution that have the expertise that I need? And if that's the case, then I would you know, encourage people to submit an R01 or a, a similar type of award. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Last, Dr. Sainz. Thank you first for the invitation to talk on this panel. Um, I wanted to use my time today to talk about funding and especially funding and getting funding early in your career as a postdoc. So my experience in this area comes from me being funded by a K99 slash R00 grant from the National Institute on Aging. And for those of you who aren't familiar with it, this is a mechanism that gives you two years of funding as a postdoc, which is primarily used to, um, to develop training that you're going to need later on to accomplish what you're going to do in the R00 phase. The R00 phase is three years of funding in a faculty position at 75%. So these are great mechanisms to build, uh, to get additional training and also to go from a postdoc to a faculty position. I'd like to use my five minutes not to talk so much about science and how to write an effective specific aims or an innovation section, I think these are things that are covered a lot when we do grant writing workshops or look up materials on grant writing. But what I wanted to talk a little bit more about is the fun part, the logistics. And you know, we're trained to think about um, grants as scientists. So we think a lot about the science, but we don't really get as much training on the logistics of getting a grant together and everything that's involved. So the Grant that you're writing, however early you want to start, start earlier than that. There's a lot more that goes into it than just the science. And we need to include a lot of the time letters of recommendation, budgets, information on the facilities and the resources that you have available at your university. 
um, also training that you're going to get in responsible conduct of research. And these are things that we're not really trained in. We're trained to do the science, but we're not trained to write budgets. So this is something that I think is one of the main reasons that it's important to start early, because a lot of the time, these things aren't things that we have familiarity with, and they're things we're going to have to reach out to people um, to get help with, especially if we're talking about letters of recommendation or writing budgets or you know, getting, having people look at your grant as well. The second tip that I had uh, was covered um, in, the, in the beginning and the introduction, which is talk to a program officer. This is something that I wish I would have done earlier as I was working on my K99 ROO grant that I think would have helped to get the grant together um, more easily and make my writing and the aims more effective. Um, following what um, Brian Downer talked about, give the training plan serious thought. So talking about a K99 slash R00 here, um, this is something that you really want to think about. I, I know talking with people at NIA about how the scores that go into a training plan correlate with funding. This looks to be one of the most um, important components of a K99 grant. But many of the time, many of many times when I talk to people who are working on a K99 or an R00 or K99 R00, they're talking all a lot about the research, but not talking as much about um, the training plan. So it's important to think carefully about the training that you want to receive and what skills you want to develop. One of the things I tell people is, you know, when you're doing a K99, this is something that's supposed to transition you to a faculty position. And when you're in a faculty position, you don't have the time to be going to classes. You don't have the time to be sitting in on classes and going to all these workshops to learn new methods or new skills. So this is really one of the last opportunities you're gonna have, really protect the time to be developing um, skills and getting additional training. Also, um, Jackie talked about the importance of teamwork. In a K99, you're going to have a mentoring team where you're going to have um, faculty who are going to be training you in specific aspects that you, or specific skills that you want to develop. So you wanna think carefully about who this team is. You wanna reach out to people, you wanna to talk to them, uh, talk about your research plan, talk about the goals and the skills that you wanna develop to make sure that they're the right ones to be, um, to be mentoring you on this grant. Another tip I have is to make sure that when you're working on your grant, you're having people from outside of your field read it. So we have a tendency, I know I do, I, I write a lot of the times when my first draft are written like I'm going to talk to someone who knows everything that I do. And so I might use some jargon, I might gloss over some points that are vital to understand if you're not coming from my field. But when these grants are being reviewed, you can have people from multiple disciplines that might not be as familiar with the topics or the methods that you're using. So make sure you talk to people outside of your field to make sure that you're doing a good job explaining what you want to do to a general scientific audience. And the last one I have is more about choosing a topic, uh, choosing a research topic. And you can go on and you can see the areas that NIH is focusing on. You can see what grants are being funded and the topics that they're focusing on. But what you don't want to do is write a grant on something that you know nothing about just because it's getting funded. What you want to do is think about it as a Venn diagram of what is fundable, what you have expertise in, and what you're passionate about doing. And where those, where those circles intersect on the Venn diagram is where you really want to be working. It's really important that you have the expertise to do the grant, and it's something that you're passionate about. I know um, thinking back to my last weekend, I spent a significant portion of my weekend fighting with factor models, trying to figure out why I'm having correlations above one. I know I, I talked with some of my colleagues on this call about it, so they know exactly what I'm talking about. But then I think to myself, you know, if this wasn't something that I was really passionate about doing, then it wouldn't be a very great way to spend your time, especially, especially on a weekend. So I'm very thankful that the area that I'm working in is something that I'm really passionate about. And I really enjoy working with these models and I really enjoy working in this area. And this really helps as you're going forward on the grant, especially here with the K99, you're looking at five years you're going to be working on this topic. So you wanna make sure that it's something that you're very passionate about. And that's everything I have.
Okay, thanks. So I would like to open it up for questions and answers. If you have a question I forgot to mention, uh, type it in the chat box and then I'll read it and we'll answer it for you. And we have about eight minutes left. Well, I guess maybe while people are typing, I'll ask, Joseph, I'll ask you a question about kind of the, the research portion and what maybe the level of expectation is for the R00. So like I, as I mentioned, the K01, the research portion is, it's not nearly to the level of like an R01 or maybe even an R03. What, how well developed was the R00 portion of your application? What's the kind of general expectation in terms of how developed a specific aim should be, for example? So you want to have it as developed as possible. Of course, you know you want to make sure that you've thought through all of the issues in the research plan and all of the things that could come up. The good news about K99 R00s is it's actually two grant proposals that you're doing. So when you submit the K99 application, you're talking about the training and you're talking about the research. But then to activate the R00 funding, the funding when you're in the faculty position, you're writing another grant, which, I mean, it doesn't go to a panel and get reviewed. Um, I think it's just the PO, but I might um, correct me if I'm wrong. But in there, you're talking about the research plan again. And so the idea of this is, you know, there's skills, or for me, there were skills that I developed as I was going through the K99 that I thought, you know, this would be how I really want to answer this question, or this would be how I, you know, these are the mediators I want to focus on. So there is an opportunity to change it as you go forward. Obviously, I can't, you know, if I'm talking about cognition, I can't go on and um, say I'm going to do life tables and mortality or something in, in the second stage, but there is an opportunity to revise it and get it more focused in the second stage, the R00. Frank, I have a question about. Uh diversity supplements, those those are under continuous review is my impression, right? That you don't have to wait for for a, a research panel to convene to review those. Those get reviewed internally. Um, so what is the lag between, uh, of, so uh, uh, certain mechanisms have to be like on the calendar year. What's the, the sort of calendar year for uh, like a diversity supplement? Can those go into effect mid-year? Do those have to go into effect in uh, September? Or what are the, the specifications there? Yeah. No, we, we have them on a rolling basis. So you, you can submit them whenever. Um, so they get, they get reviewed regularly. So it, it won't be too much time uh, to uh, get a decision. Um, but when you when you put them in, so you're trying to get a decision. Do you get a decision for the following year, or can you get a decision for, I don't know, funding to go on effect in May? I, I can't hear you. Wow, you sound kind of. Um, can you hear me now? Yeah. A little better. Okay, I'll, I'll just talk about you. Um, can you? Is there a particular calendar time when a funding mechanism goes into effect, or can you get a, something that goes under continuous re regular review to go into effect in, say, May or January? It, it takes about uh, one to two or three months for the review to happen. So uh, it, there's no deadline for it. Um, so whenever uh, you you want to submit it, you can do that. Okay. I have a question from Jorge Juan Lambrinos. Um, in addition to the PO, do you recommend to introduce yourself to members of the NIA Advisory Council, many times if you and your research are known to the council, it may help in getting additional positive points. Um, I, I, the council meets, uh, the, the funding recommendations are, are done by the director and 
uh, the PLs make recommendations so they, they could influence the uh, decision. Um, but the council, you could get to know them, but a better way would be to talk to your program officer and inform a relationship so that they could advocate for you. This has been really great. Uh, we got about three minutes left. I, I guess we'll wait and see if there's any more questions. Bill, I have a question. I was wondering if we could just see a show of hands for those who are thinking about uh, submitting a proposal, an application to NIA or to another agency at NIH. <laughs> And I was going to mention quick too, what was extremely helpful for me in writing both my K and my R01 was seeing examples of other recently funded proposals. Um, so if anyone on the call is planning to write a K01, I'd be more than happy to, to share mine. Um, same for an R01 if anyone's interested and um, is planning to submit. Okay, then, well, I, I think that's it for us. Uh, appreciate everybody sticking through with us today, uh, the, the four hours of the first day. We have another four hours tomorrow starting at 1 p.m. Um, yeah, 1 p.m. Central. I, if, if there's anything else, all right, then I'll see you all tomorrow. Thanks again for everybody right, sticking around. Thank you. Phil. Bye. Bye. Congratulations, everyone. Yeah. Uh...